Yeah. It has value because we know the aliens like it. Yes. Because L. Ron Hubbard was an honest man. And his <laughs> books, <laughs> they, they, can, they, 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 they can foresee the future, Max. I like... Bashing on Scientology is just like... It's too easy. It's boring. Like, it's really boring, and you'll get sued. No, you <laughs> won't. I'm also mad at South Park in general. South Park just... Ugh, it needs to stop existing. But What would you have them do instead? Um, make more Broadway musicals, because the Book of Mormon was really fucking entertaining and well They done. really like musicals. They do. Those guys. I'd like them to make another movie. You really like Team America. You've been talking about Team America a lot recently. Really? Yeah. What was When did I mention it before? Uh, well, you brought it up like 10 minutes ago, and you brought it up uh, during the preschool. You brought it up during Kubo um, when we were talking about puppetry and movies. Um, well, I think, frankly, it makes sense in both of those. It comes to mind for a reason. Maybe you should elaborate if we're just going to start here because the... Uh, the Nazgul or whatever in the background <laughs> stop screaming. So uh, I think you should definitely elaborate on uh, that. What was the idea for Gingerbread Christ or whatever you call what? it? We're going back there? Uh, that was a distant This dump. is your pitch for your movie. Go, okay. elevator pitch. Um, we find out... Okay, so our protagonist right. is a lowly uh, Catholic researcher. I don't know. He's a priest who like researches old documents and whatnot. Sure. And he's always been perplexed. He, like, he gets the metaphor of just like, oh, this is the body of Christ, but it's just like, well, but why do we do that? It's kind of weird. And then he finds a scrap of a document that fi- yeah, proves that Jesus Christ was actually a gingerbread man. Right. And We're rewriting history. The Vatican has been hiding that from people for centuries. Does it become a paranoid thriller? Yes. And, but the thing with, that we really need though here is like the flashbacks to the stations of the cross with Jesus as a gingerbread man. Yes. Uh, as a giant, <laughs> a giant 33 year old <laughs> gingerbread man. <laughs> oh man. And then you can just, you can have like all the classic quotes from the Bible and then you you deploy them in the movie. And they have new meaning because he's a gingerbread man. So yes. when Satan tempts him in the desert and he says, no, Satan, man cannot live on bread alone. Maybe this Maybe time he just says, says gingerbread. <laughs> yes. Yes. All he needs is gingerbread. Do you have gingerbread, Satan? Get thee behind. I'm actually more of a pound cake. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh Satan. Wow, that was a that was a great intro. I'm glad that we did that. Movie and we pitch. just lost a lot of money because somebody's yeah. gonna make that. Yeah. You're welcome. Trademark spe- spectator film podcast. Neil Gaiman, we know you you listen. Oh God, what if Neil Gaiman was our only listener? Like, not just a listener, just the only listener. He's the only one who listen. Really. Then I would say he's secretly <laughs> one of our uh, fathers. Either one of our fathers, and uh, he's just been monitoring us from afar, and for some reason he can't reach out to us. Um, oh. And this is just his way of, of paying attention to us. Well, that's true. Uh, hi, Neil. I, I, I love your work. I love your... Uh, Call him Dad. No, he likes that. I'm not. <laughs> I'm actually also a fan of his wife, so I'm not going to uh, do that. Although they do have an open marriage, so... Wait, what? Neil Gaiman's wife. Uh, Why would that preclude you from f- from being his lost child uh, no but calling people dad in this internet age has taken on a new meaning um okay i really need to like s- is that a different podcast i need to surround yeah we're gonna make a secondary podcast called max drowns austin in internet filth because i make so many internet references that you're just like can the subtitle be and i ignore it no <laughs> I, a- I think that would be what it is I'm Austin, by the way, and oh. I ignore internet filth. I'm Max, and I drown in it. it. You drown in it. I was going to say I swim in it, but you breathe it. Yes, I eat it. You make it. This is this is the weirdest intro we've ever done. <sighs> I'm enjoying it so far, though. Yeah, I'm. We've got some really great ideas on the table. It's building up the awkwardness. We've just... got some gingerbread on the table. This intro is building up a lot of awkwardness, just like the, today's movie builds up a lot of suspense. What? Yeah. 
Oh my God. It's Strangers on a Train, and this is oh, I thought the it was, spec. Oh, okay. I thought it was, thought it was Strangers on a Strain. Um. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I got to laugh at you. Really? Yeah. I just, not because that's funny. I just can't believe you just said that. Like, you really. I get, I kind of want to do that now. That's like so bad, it's perfect. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, this is the Spectator Film Podcast, and we're uh, we're doing uh, Strangers on a Train this week, yes. triumphantly, triumphantly, wonderfully, heroically, mm-hmm. against all those words, against uh, all probably odds. better judgment. Um, we're lending our two cents to a film of master filmmaker Alfred Hitchcock, so of master weirdo. All filmmakers are weirdos. Like let's let's. Hmm. Is that a challenge? Name one prolific, accomplished director who's not a weirdo. I'm trying to name any. I'm trying to name like terrible filmmakers. They're also weirdos. Terrible filmmakers are especially weirdos. It's like two ends of the spectrum. How about this? If you're an auteur, you're probably a weirdo. Not even like... Neil Breen's an auteur. No joke. He's not. He totally... You can tell. We need to stop talking about Neil Breen. He doesn't... Unless we do him on the show. We're not doing any Neil Breen movies on the show. Um, you want to do Battlefield Earth and you won't do Neil Breen? I don't want to do Battlefield Earth. I just like bringing it up because it Cause morally it, defeated you when we it watched it. it makes my like hair stand up on the back of my neck. And John Travolta can I come re- over and touch my face. <laughs> 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 what is even this beginning? God. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so John Travolta's in this movie, Strangers on a Train, 1951. It's actually his first role. He's an uncredited extra in the background. He's a fetus. <laughs> he is the ch- <laughs> He is the child <laughs> that a uh, guy is having with Miriam. We'll get to that during the movie, though. This was my pick. I'm trying to get this back on the rails, Max. It was never on the rails. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this was my pick, and um, I don't know why I chose it. I do know why I chose this as the first Hitchcock, Hitchcock movie to do. I don't know why I wanted to do it this week. Just because, just for contrast, um, I thought it'd be interesting to do. I feel like Strangers on a Train, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier, is maybe like the best intro point for Hitchcock because it is a good Hitchcock movie without being one of his like really great ones. And in a weird way, it's also maybe his most, um, I don't know, typical Hitchcock yeah, movie. I was going to say, this is like average Hitchcock for me. This is like not one of his weirder... I obviously made this for money when I was making a bajillion films, but this is played more for a mainstream audience, which is good. Yeah, it's a crowd pleaser. Um, but also it's like... It's also not... Ooh, I was watching a bonus feature that just came up. Anyway. They didn't need to know that. Um, well, I just give them you know, a little peek behind the curtain. Of how it constantly we fuck up. Um, yeah, well, I mean, they can tell. But if we hang a lantern on it, maybe they, they won't mind as much. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah. I wouldn't say this is even in my top five favorite Hitchcock movies. I'm not a... I like Hitchcock. I respect him as a filmmaker for what he accomplished and what he's added to the medium in general. But... Like, this isn't one of my favorite. It, it's better than some of the ones I like. But like, I like the birds better than this movie. But and I don't think you're a fan of the birds, right? I'm, I'm not that big of a fan of the birds. Um, I think this is more successful as a movie than the birds. But I have some. Well, the birds is again more like strange. Yes. Um, and all his movies have Hitchcockian elements in them, but this is the most like. This, this is, is just this is the most typical one, you know. And in that way, it's kind of bland. It yeah, it's very. I was saying before, it's kind of straightforward. There's not a lot of room for interpretation or just like ambiguousness. It's like no, this is what's happening. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, it's in terms of its plot, yeah, definitely. But it doesn't go out on a limb like his other movies. So if you're saying like in comparison, yeah, definitely. Well, you you kind of have to like. I'm I'm assuming our audiences have seen at least one or two Hitchcock films, if not many, many more. Mm-hmm. Um, for a point of reference for uh, Hitchcock, I know during our Creature of the Black Lagoon uh, commentary, I mentioned that that was the first horror movie I saw 
the second two I saw were The Birds and Psycho. Um, both of which I liked Psycho as a kid. Right. Um, the Birds I thought was dumb and stupid. Um, <laughs> Why are these birds attacking people, Mom? Not even that. Like, it was just like... I, re- I remember when I was young, I'm like, this ending is dumb. They just left. Do like, you think it was, like, boring? Um, c- For the most part, yeah, because there is that one, like, pretty graphic, like, scene where you see, like, the some eyes, the picked eyes out. packed yeah, out. Yeah, it's freaky. Which is, like, I'm surprised yeah. my parents let me see that when I was a young child. Uh, but I, I do remember, I liked Psycho when I was younger. Um, I went on much later to watch some of his other films, uh, more notably uh, Vertigo and Rear Window, both of which I clearly enjoy um but hitchcock's a filmmaker i respect but he's not a filmmaker that i return to on a regular basis that often he's more of an academic reference point for me a lot of the time i respect his movies i enjoy them but it's a rare occasion i go out of my way to watch one of his movies so right i was surprised when he suggested this but it's a good thing to talk about right i would say i'm much more familiar with a lot of his other stuff um in comparison to you, because I, not that I've watched a, like a lot of them frequently, but he does have a lot of really good movies in there. But again, a lot of them have more of a premise or more of an idea that makes them stand apart from this one. This one is just, he is really good at making movies. He knows how to tell a story visually and he knows how to tell a thriller suspense story. And that's what he does here. Uh, he took this book by Patricia Highsmith, which we may talk about a little bit over the course of this, um, not to completely run us off the rails again, but this equally seems like something that is at home with the rest of her writing and, you know, uh, all the Mr. Ripley books and whatever. Um, But again, the weird thing about this that, okay, we can also connect it to Psycho in this way. Another Hitchcockian thing about this, this very much is the most Hitchcockian movie. Uh, He bought the screenplay or well, he bought the rights to make the movie of this for seventy five hundred dollars, I think, okay. which was super cheap. It was uh, Patricia Highsmith Smith's first book, and of course, he kept his name name anonymous because he was well known at this time. They would yeah. market his name above things, and uh, that's how he got it for so cheap. Same thing he did with Psycho. Sneaky. Have you read the book that Psycho is based on, though? It's, no, it's not great. Um, it's a basic premise and everything, but it's it's not a page turner that much. He, he definitely pumped that full of suspense. I'm not saying it makes it right, but like... Right. I mean, I also haven't read this book, so I wouldn't know what is... It's like The Shining, where it's like... Eh, a lot of Stephen King's books are better serviced by their movie adaptations than the actual book themselves, but... I can't speak to that, because I've never read a Stephen King book. Okay. Congratulations. You're, I'm proud of it. Your Max. medal's in the mail. Thank you. Anyway. Can anyone hear that? I could. Yeah. Is the door open? That would be you because you were the last one to leave. Oh my god. Come up with something to say. I'll be right back. No, just go up and close the door. Yeah, yeah, oh my god. This is a disaster. I'll just cut it out, don't worry. Everything's a disaster. I'll just cut it out. Everything's a disaster. We're anyway, all gonna die. So uh yeah, so I chose this movie um for those reasons, and it was just time we, that we sort of talked about a Hitchcock movie. Um I think this movie is interesting for a lot of the typical Hitchcockian thing themes. You have the idea of Um, performative identity being the source of drama, right? The difference between who you are on the inside and the way people look at you and the way people perceive you being the source of drama and the difference between those two things causing our protagonist a whole lot of issues. Uh, That is very typical of Hitchcock. He kept doing that over and over again. Uh, Another thing he did frequently was stuff with like doubling and uh, sort of multiple versions of the same thing um, and, and sort of coming into conflict with each other. Uh, That sort of happens here um, with Bruno and Guy. And uh, yeah, it's got all the typical Hitchcock things. So 
I don't know. There's going to be plenty to talk about, but at the same time, I feel like this movie again is so Hitchcockian. It's so by the numbers Hitchcock that it also loses some steam for me Um, at a certain point. I just spoilers for the movie. I just wish that like at any point we got any sort of like, because there is the one scene where he's going into the guy's house, but like our main character, as we know him, is never like we're never just like is he gonna is he gonna murder no like we know he doesn't want to be involved in this we know he has no desire to kill the other guy's father I just like I wish that we like saw his sanity teetering on the edge more than we get to in the movie maybe you would enjoy the book more because I think he actually goes through with it in the book uh, I don't even need him to necessarily go through with it. I just like... You just need that tension more. I, I want to think that he might. Yeah. I think that tension is there, but it is missing like... Here's the thing it's missing, I think. Because I agree with you that it's not overtly expressed. But I think it is there. The question of whether or not he'll do it is just very lightly hit upon. And because Farley Granger is not a good actor, <laughs> he does not sell it in those very few moments. You need like a close-up of his just like blank face and like a gun. Like, but you have to do it like, you have to do it in a way where you really show some sort of going back and forth. There's no, this is a cliche way to do it, but there's no pacing moment. You know what I mean? I guess, but like, there's no like definitive moment where we can tell he's really like thinking about it. I don't even need a moment. I just need the tension build up. But like, he's just getting more and more progressively annoyed the entire movie of just like, you leave me alone. I've said I'm not going to kill him. Oh, but you have to kill him. You said you wouldn't. And it's just like, it goes on for a bajillion years. And right. I'm not saying it's bad because I do, I do. I want to say I like this movie for the record. Right. I, I enjoy watching it. Um, I just, it kind of wraps itself up with a neat little bow at the end. And I, it really does. I, I wasn't expecting that. And we're going to talk about that when it happens at the key scene, when he goes to uh, Bruno's dad's chateau or whatever. Um, and he pets that doggy. Um, Good dog. That's the most important moment. Yeah. Um, but again, I agree with you where like the movie, I think takes a real turn at that point. Um, and that doesn't mean it goes off the rails, but it's kind of like at that point you really, the idea of guy being guilty at that point is totally gone because you really displace and like reaffirm the boundary between good and bad. You know, at that point on Bruno is definitively bad Guy is the definitively good guy. We know he's going to do the right thing, yeah. right? And, and like, it releases that question, which, again, like you said, has been posed kind of weakly throughout the movie. I can, and I'll get to that as we start watching the film for different aspects of like where I think that... Because that's, that's what doesn't sell this movie for me right? overall. Um, and there are certain points where I think they could have... It could have been the lead actor's performance, but like... It could be the writing, it could be the direction, but there are points where I'm just like, ah, if you had just done this slightly differently, I think it could have been mm-hmm. like a really like creepy, like, oh, it, will this ordinary man commit murder yeah, story, which it goes yeah. for, but nah. I think I agree with you. I think the thing that wins out here is that uh, Hitchcock was going to be like, I'm making the movie my way, and this is going to be the screenplay. And we'll talk about that as well. Actually, maybe I should just pull it up. I don't know. But the the amount of like amazing like American writers he got to work on the screenplay and he threw all of them in the trash. He got John Steinbeck, Dashiell Hammett, Thornton Wilder, and then Raymond Chandler hated all their drafts and then got rid of all of them. Uh, and um, and then I guess he, well, he passed it off to uh, his wife. Yeah. And uh, the writer, I, bl- I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right. I think her name is Senzi Ormond. And then, uh, oh, there was one other woman um, who was, uh, I think, a production assistant who helped with bringing the script together. It was those three women who really wrote the screenplay. And what they did, there was not a lot from the novel left over, but they took the premise and they kept the premise and and then they sort of changed almost everything else. Um, But I think the movie is very effective is the thing we both agree about. Right. Even if we don't think it's like it's hitting home the tension for us, it's like a very tight structure. Efficient is the word I would efficient over effective. Um, 
Well, it has all the setups and payoffs, I think. Yeah, okay, yeah. But yeah, it's yeah. like, it, I don't think it hits the notes hard enough, maybe. But they are there. And again, I think it's the thing where Hitchcock is stubborn and he's like, I want the movie to be done my way, right? And we're going to make it as lean as possible. And, you know, even if I was working with an actor that I felt like wasn't up to the task mm-hmm. of conveying like that inner torment, I would be like, okay, I might have to add another scene or something to make up for that. And I don't think Hitch would ever do that, frankly, because mm, I, yeah. I feel like he would just be like, this, this is the movie. No, that was a really good Richard Nixon impression. <laughs> <laughs> this is the movie. There you go. That's your Hitchcock. So are you, do you want to start the movie now? Please. Oh, actually, before we start, I do want to one, mention one more thing. Okay. This is maybe not the best movie to go into it with Hitchcock. Okay. Being a weirdo. Yes. And misogynistic. He is. Uh, I don't know if it's that simple. I would say all his movies, he definitely... Here's what I think it is. You can find a lot of conversations about the treatment of women in Hitchcock's movies and his treatment of them on set, which is kind of weird. Well, it goes beyond weird, frankly. That you know what? Forget I just said that. That's wrong. His treatment of women on set is wrong and bad, and I would call it abusive. I don't think he ever, like touched anybody or stuff but he was very controlling and manipulative and uh you know mean at times and i think the thing that i see in his movies in terms of the treatment towards women is that uh sometimes his heroines completely defy that and they're very admirable in their portrayal but also he really savors the the opportunity to punish a woman well, I feel like. if we're going to talk about Okay, there are, in my opinion, four notable female characters in this movie. Um, And I would say three of them are laughable portrayals of women. Which ones are they? Okay. We have Um, Miriam, right? And then... Yeah, so we... Yeah, here. Let me go through. Uh, We have Miriam, who is our main character's initial wife. She's just... The movie hates her. (laughs) Yeah, the movie hates her. Like, you're supposed to hate her, but it's just like... She is connivingly evil. She's just like, oh, I'm going to trick you into giving me money for a divorce, if the, if and then the I'm going to buy myself things. The, you, the movie might as well put like a sticker on her head that says, "I am like a I godless be- sinner." She, need, she <laughs> needs. She needs to. She needs to grow a mustache so she can twirl it. Like, she's purely evil. She's That's like, why she has those Satan horn glasses. That yeah. She wears. Um. She's the worst. We have his next love interest, Anne Morton. Anne Morton, who is she's perfect. And you know why she's perfect? Why? Because she trusts him implicitly and does whatever he says, just like a woman should, like a good woman should for a man. And uh, that makes me deeply uncomfortable. We have the mother character who is sort of a proto Mrs. Bates. Sort of Norma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, She's... Although I do enjoy her more. I enjoy her, but like as a character, she's just like, you know, women who connect with their sons graze psychopaths, which is not a very healthy attitude to have. Yeah, I mean, that's the Freudian milieu at the time, definitely, too, with Hitchcock stuff. And if these were our three female main characters, then I would talk entirely about how misogynistic this movie is the entire time. But there is one saving grace, thank God, which is the greatest character in the movie, which is Barbara, who is absolutely wonderful, and I love her. Right. Um, I mean, also, uh, it's okay for a, a movie to have female characters be like accessory characters or not the main character, right? Um, I think the thing we react to more is the frequency with which it happens and also, frankly, like get bored by seeing it so frequently. And also, like, it's not merely that. It is, it is the way in which Hitchcock manipulates you through identification and likes to... Uh, sort of dangle women as the object in peril and then sometimes just like brutally like destroy them. Uh, and in this movie that doesn't really happen except for Miriam, but she's never really given a chance to be sympathetic really in the first place. Um, and I think the, the thing with this movie is that it's kind of, it has the most basically like 
basic kind of, I, I, I wouldn't even call it sexism because on its own it's not, but it's like, it is just the female characters are accessories to the male character. And it is just as simple Which as Which is inherently sexist. If, but not on its own. Yes, you can it have is. a it's, movie where the main character is a man and the female characters, you know, do it like serve a, a sort of, um, oh my God, what is the other term? Not a lead character, but supporting role, right? You can have that. Yes, but there's a difference between that and making it so every female character is inter like their entire arc, their story and their goals are intertwined with making a man happy. Right. Which well, also we should clarify none of the female characters in this have arcs. Um, that's not true. Barb goes from being wonderful to useful and wonderful. Um, well, that's the other thing too. I think with, um, you know what? You're actually right. She does change. And that comes up with a moment I wanted to bring up later where the movie kind of holds her responsible for being dismissive of Miriam. Um, but anyway, like, uh, here's the other thing about it. Both Anne Morton and Barbara are useful to our protagonists and they like help and they do, and they're capable of doing things. Almost right? like accessories. Um, right. But I'm, I'm saying that those two and Anne things, Morton doesn't do a lot. She makes things worse at one point. Um, oh, by going to see the mother. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's a complicated conversation to have, but it's very clear that he Hitchcock to me is the type of like liberal humanist. I wouldn't even necessarily say like liberal, but humanist director who who for him for him the default human is just going to be the white man, right? And that just is what it is. So he'll he will explore the human condition, but it will be through through that prism, right? And it, when he thinks of other things or doing other stuff, it's just kind of not his concern. And that's like the root of his sexism in his movies. And because he is also somebody who I think is like suppressed a lot of uh, strange things. And uh, he had a lot of kinks, I think, that sort of come out in his movies um, in terms of uh, like fantasies he's expressing. Uh, because he's doing that and he's also comfortable in his own perspective and not really thinking outside of it, even though he does critique it in certain films, uh, he sort of, you wind up in this situation where really you see a lot of interesting female characters throughout his movies, um, but it really varies. And even those interesting female characters, it's in a limited capacity. So I just thought that was worth bringing up because I think that's a big part of his movies that a lot of people talk about, but, um, you know, maybe not in reference to this movie as much because there's really just not as much intrigue with the female characters here. Yeah. I wouldn't say intrigue, but they, they don't have as, there's much not as much going on that they're, I don't know for, for being the inciting incident, they are less focused later on in the movie, but yeah. Anyway, we should start talking about the movie. We should start the movie. You may now watch the film. Why do you keep doing that voice? That's the Hitchcock voice. Here we are, Max. What? Is that too loud? No, I'm sorry. I can't hear you because you shouted it into the microphone before we started this episode. We needed a uh, slate and we don't have one in the budget. So I shouted so we can see it on the top. <laughs> Without the, telling uh, me. Yeah. I, well, I like to keep you on your toes. <laughs> My ears are still ringing. Yeah. Uh, luckily, we have subtitles and title credits so I can see this is, in fact, Strangers on a Train, though. Oh, I can't my God. Hear Patricia anymore. Hitchcock. She's your favorite character, right? Yes, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, she plays Barbara. I know. But here we are. We already have... Oh, yes. Senzi Ormond uh, was the uh, assistant to Ben Hecht who got the uh, uh, the main credit for the uh, writing of this movie alongside Raymond Chandler. He didn't actually write the movie, uh, but he still got credit for it because they wanted to sell it. <laughs> um, also, Raymond Chandler's letter back to Hitchcock um, rejecting... Or letter about Hitchcock rejecting his draft is hilarious. Uh, and I'm going to post that in the show notes. And here we have the famous introduction of Bruno and Guy. Um, and already, we're starting with the themes of what I would say 
are going off of Robin Wood's analysis in his excellent book, uh, Hitchcock's Films. Uh, he calls it the world of order and chaos contrast, um, where Guy, in his character and his uh, desires and goals and motivations, he aspires to the world of uh, order, right? Which is symbolized here by politics. Yeah. And specifically the Capitol building. And we see it in the first shot. And Bruno represents this expression of chaos that is entering his life at the last moment in, in his transition into this world of order and, and sort of uh, maturity. And he's going to fuck things up. And I'm sure that was more pronounced when this movie came out. But like, because watching it now, it's very easy to just be like, oh, it's too well-dressed rich dudes walking yeah. toward the same train. And that's with- something I think about with Hitchcock a lot because he seems like a very judgmental person where he he assumes you infer a lot about a character by little details. And sometimes you do, but other times it's like, what? But here we go. The beginning of this mo- sort of sequence. Uh, the s- seduction sequence, so to speak. This is where the... It, the way everybody talks about the homoerotic undertones of this movie, this is where it begins. Well, do you recognize that in this scene or no? Um, here's the thing. I'm conflicted. I was thinking about this and I'm conflicted because in past times when it was not society, yeah, like acceptable to be yeah, gay in public, you did like there were things like that, just like, oh, you brush up against the foot and, like, see what kind of response you get from a person, like, try to do it all that way, and I get that. Oh, that's a smoke alarm. Keep talking. Uh, we're going we're gonna to die doing this podcast. It's fine. Um, at the same time, um, it kind of just, like, any sexuality in this movie, because it's very clear he's only, like, guys only attracted to women. It's just, like, if Bruno is gay, it's kind of like, look how weird and other he is. Well, he's a flamboyant gay yes. person. But also, I, I, when, I, when I see this as a seduction sequence, it's because of its similarities structurally to the idea of this like, idea of like picking somebody up, right? That's the way he approaches him, right? Um, and it sort of, it plays similarly, even though the goals are not, explicitly about anything sexual like okay bruno is approaching him with a very specific goal in mind right but it's not at all what he's purporting to be interested in talking about on the face of things right yeah i don't know it's just i don't there's a lot of things in this movie that like and then they have a secret they have to keep together right yeah, but you can't really... If it's supposed to be like, oh, they had sex, then... No, no, no. It's not literally homoerotic. Okay. What I'm saying is like there's... You can draw a parallel between that, and that is in that is where the homoerotic subtext, I think, exists. It exists, but I think it kind of peters out. Like it's hard to keep that... Meta- like having an intelligible conversation about that undertone or any possible parallels that could exist for it kind of peter out as the movie goes on yeah i don't think it's a helpful conversation to have in relation to this movie i don't think it adds a lot i mean i think it adds a sort of idea of um how you can see guy relating to the female characters maybe but also it, it might also be something where people who um are sort of more familiar with like hitchcock in general and the way this movie was made so like farley granger guy is a gay actor and this is the second time he's appeared in a Hitchcock movie. Uh, the first time was in Rope, in which he is also paired with a very flamboyant, implied gay character, right? And even if you don't think there's a homoerotic subtext between their relationship, I think we can both agree that uh, Bruno and his flamboyance, there's an implied gayness to that, right? In here? No. No. You don't think the movie sees him as being some sort of... Um, I think it tries to make him seem eccentric and dandy, but I think it's kind of 
demeaning and somewhat insulting to just be like, oh, well, he's gay because of that. Um, I'm saying the, I'm, I agree with you. And this is the thing we're talking about with the shoes. Like, how, what are we supposed to infer from the shoes specifically? I think he's just supposed to be eccentric and over the top. Um, well, there you go. But also, like, uh, in terms of rope as well. Well, if, if we're talking about, I don't know. I don't know how much, well, a lot about Hitchcock's politics. He did right. hate fascists, so at least he has that going for him. Um, on the other hand, like, this isn't, you could do that. Queer coding is a thing for villainous characters, even if it makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, like the James um, Bond villains. James Bond Sometimes, villains, yeah. um, a lot of Disney characters, especially from the 90s. Um, but, like, at the same time, ugh, I don't know. It's That's the thing about the signifiers of what what a person is supposed to be. Because Hitchcock works in, like, broad strokes always, right? He makes genre movies using stock characters. And then sometimes they come to life. Um, sometimes the performances are not quite as good, though. Sometimes they're like Farley Granger's performance in this movie. But... Uh, you know, he always plays in stock characters. And that's why when you have somebody who might be implied gay in a movie from way long ago and the signifiers change over time, when you watch it now, it's like, well, he's certainly like different, you know, but it doesn't necessarily stick out that way because we've come to think about this idea of what it means to be gay completely differently. But I don't know. That's either way. That's a conversation that lots of people have about this movie. Yeah. Oh, and just to clarify for our listeners who don't know the uh, yeah, media practice of queer coding, which is basically any villainous character you have in right. a film, you attribute characteristics that are often attributed to yeah people who are homosexual, bisexual, LGBTQA plus um to them to put in the minds of not just younger viewers, but viewers in general that like, these are traits that villainous and bad people have in order to or look how weird they are. Yeah. In order to try to get people away from it. Aren't they a freak? It's becoming less common. It's still decently common. Right. I mean, I think the most comical over the top example of it from like our generation would be him from Powerpuff Girls, but that's just, I have no idea what that is. You don't? Oh, it's a cross-dressing devil lobster who is one of the main villains in Powerpuff Girls. Oh my God, he's wearing a lobster tie. Oh my God. It all comes Connections. back. Connections. Hitchcock made Powerpuff Girls. Yes. Jesus Christ. Conspiracy. No, Power, yeah, Powerpuff Girls influenced Strangers on the Train. <laughs> Terry, that, I was wrong. You're, you are correct. I stand corrected. Oh man. But here we go, the famous scene. He's going to propose to him. He's going to propose a murder. Most foul. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, he oh, will I'm have sorry. a similar no, a murder experience. Mo- a murder most foul is actually um, the description for the birds, another Hitchcock film. Oh, um, yeah. That's very clever of you. I know. Anyway, so in terms of, uh, we were talking over it, but in terms of, uh, again, characterizing these two men as being from representatives of sort of two different worlds, right? One of order and one of chaos. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in, in, in Woods' book about this. Um, but he talks about how Bruno, you know, always talks about this idea of doing anything you want to do and being free and, you know, having control or something. Right. And that represents this idea of like a lax lack of responsibilities or order or structure to life. Right. Again, he says that, but there's like, it's not actually how he exists in reality. In reality, he becomes crazy and frightening and violent. Right. And how Guy seems to yearn for a type of uh, structure to his life that is the opposite, the exact opposite of what Bruno is. But again, he br- the thing is, Bruno recognizes the impulse in him to indulge in that sort of chaotic world. And uh, we'll pause for this uh, jazz musician with his uh, upright bass. Yeah, that's really weird that the movie dwells on him for so long for not an important character. Yeah, you know, um, it's a really shit moment. I yeah. really hate that moment, Max. And act, that actor was terrible. I really would hope he never got any work I in hope he tripped. Again. I hope he fucking tripped. Fell on his face. Stupid old man. Bet he smelled bad. I mean, I'm sure he did. <laughs> <laughs> fun fact about yeah, fun fact about Hitchcock. He tried to en- yeah, enlist in the British Army to fight in World War One. He was too overweight to get in. Um, oh, I thought you were gonna say he smelled too bad. To get in. 
I mean, I think that was a requirement to fight in World War One. You have oh. to smell like flowers. But anyway, oh, here we go. We're going to get introduced to uh, Miriam, who, again, is another expression of this chaos world that that uh, Guy is trying to break free from. This is the entire arc of this movie, the trajectory of Guy. Uh, he goes from this this world of disorder and lack of responsibility to a world of structure, right? And again, there's a lot of different layers we can add to that dynamic, right? She talks about, oh, you're going to go play with your rich friends, right? It's also a, a transition from a lower or middle class world to an upper class world. He's going to marry a senator's daughter. He's going to play tennis. Yeah. What's a more rich people sport than fucking playing tennis? Uh, polo. Ooh, oh, there you, you've got me. Yeah. Oh, man, can you imagine if... That sequence would be way more exciting, <laughs> honestly, if he was on a horse. Because then it's like you have to interact with an animal, and you're, if you're not calm, maybe like a horse will buck you or something. Maybe it was Polo originally, and they tried to film that no. scene. It was just... Because imagine... you see, Remember how bad luck they had with the dog actor in this movie? <laughs> we'll get to that, yeah. Dog wanted no part of it. And so maybe the horses were even worse, and they had to refilm yeah. so much of the movie. Do you think this is a good time to talk about how stupid Guy is? Oh, uh, yeah. Just um, has no thoughts in his brain whatsoever. No. And like the very notion that like at the beginning of this movie, he doesn't instantly go to the police. Well, also it's, well, it's not only that it's like, what, what is going on here? They're trying to get a divorce. Maybe laws were different with divorces. Well, I think why it, is he not giving the money right to the lawyer? Why would you trust your conniving well, divorces wife? Divorces were harder in the fifties. And it like, I don't know what, what state is this? This is, uh, I'm not sure which state this is in because this is sort of all up and down the East Coast. I know they talk yeah. about the Southamptons uh, sometimes, but also you go back to the uh, uh, Capitol building to, to Washington, D.C. multiple times. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. But so I think she's like playing the villainous female who's like, they only get a divorce if we both want it. And if I say you're leaving me alone with a child, then they won't let you because you'll be a layabout and yeah. you'll have to pay for my... Someone else's child. Yeah. But he's just so stupid for getting into this situation in the first place by... Like, even if she was specifically this evil, it's like he said... He's so... He is so thoughtless in his need for structure because for some reason that's just his impulse like consciously, but his, all his like sort of uh, subconscious behavior is just towards being stupid and also behaving like Bruno. Right. I don't know what it is about his character that keeps him from being Bruno, but obviously that is like part of his natural state. And for some reason he has an aspiration towards structure, which is why I think Bruno is so easily able to manipulate him because Bruno is very much like a, uh, a displaced part of his psyche. And personified, you know? I guess. Um, like, what is... I don't understand, like, her motivation. Like, because on the surface, she has simple motivations. Is right. like, I want this rich boy to keep supporting me and right. for me to be able to do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. But if... It's short-sighted. But if she wants to move to Washington, she's going to lose all of her various boy toys that she has in here. She'll she, just find new ones. Will she? And here's Ruth Roman, who very importantly, Max, would later go on to star in the little movie called The Baby. It's amazing. That movie is that movie's better than this movie. <laughs> uh, that movie is amazing. Okay. Oh, my God. Oh, God. But do you see what I mean? He's just so stupid. He never thinks of anything. He's so plain. There's a reason why his name is Guy. Yeah, also, like, he doesn't need to keep shouting this. I said I could strangle her. He, she, I he, said I'd fucking rip her heart out. He should just be like, oh, never mind. Yeah. There's a great moment of uh, Hitchcock's uh, sense of humor. <laughs> just the like fade to the like strangling hands. And then he's getting a manicure. Or is that a pedicure? I don't know. And here we have the uh, proto Norman Bates, Norma Bates relationship which again like you said is that type of like freudian pop psychology where if um like a man can't differentiate himself from his mother at a certain point in his maturation he will wind up being some sort of like dandy weirdo who like does weird sex things and probably kills people 
Yeah. And this weird nuzzling affection with his mother. Yeah. But I will say this is a good time to talk about, um, oh God, I'm confusing it now with Robin Woods, but I, his name is Robert Walker. I think the actor who died shortly after this movie came out, but I think his act- his interactions with his mother specifically are just like great. I, he gives the best performance of this movie, and I love how passive aggressive, emphasis on the aggressive, everything he does is. Yeah, every smile is like concealing a type of like anger or, or disdain for something he's looking at. You know, he does a really good job in this movie. Especially when he's like being mean to children. <laughs> I think we both found that we, we we laughed quite a bit when he popped that kid's balloon. Well, that was an effortless scene too. Yeah. It seemed so natural. Like it, it like <laughs> Fuck I, you, kid. I could have believed that like that kid accidentally bumped into him like yeah. during that and he just did that instinctively. Yeah. Speaking of pointing out aggressive. Yeah. And again, he has the uh you know, this is playing on Freudian pop psychology. We have, you know, again, weird Oedipal situation going on here where he wants to kill his father and he's totally manipulating and controlling his mother as well. Mm. Uh, very Freudian. Hitchcock was into that sort of thing. They're ready with your call. We were talking about that. Just like oh, how weird it was back in the day. They had to like bake your call like a <laughs> hot pocket or whatever. <laughs> but I don't, do you bake hot pockets? How do you make Hot Pockets? You put them in a fucking microwave. Okay. I've never had one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And then, uh, My pockets are always cold. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, and here's the second time, guys, a fucking idiot. Why would you talk on the phone with somebody who is weird? Uh, are you getting your divorce? And he says no. He answers the question. It all could have ended here. Because even Bruno, Bruno uh, sort of knew that he didn't get the affirmative on the train, apparently. But now he knows that guy still harbors that anger, right? He knew he couldn't get away with it if, if Miriam agreed to the divorce. But since she didn't and she's double-crossing him, now he knows that he can truly implicate Guy in the murder because he knows Guy has the motivation and Guy uh, is guilty of the motivation, right? Yes. And interestingly enough, that's what Guy expresses guilt over later on in the movie. It's not the fact that Miriam is ever dead that causes him problems. No, nobody cares that Miriam's dead. Yeah, um, least of all Guy. He's just, he's, the only thing he's worried about is worried about being found out. Because again, he's trying to ascend into this world of politics. It's going to ruin everything. Also, as somebody who's like trying to inconspicuously kill this person for like his plan of just like, oh, I'm just a random stranger. I'd have no reason to. He goes out of his way to like show his face to her numerous times and people around her and like make right. big scenes. He's supposed to be like this like suave, yeah, sociopathic, just like emotionless killer. Yeah. He's really bad at it. And here we get some more uh, contrast again between these two different worlds we're alternating between in the movie where again, the uh, sort of unstructured one is pictured here as like sort of rural you know, an idea of rural America and it's going to become even more specific where we end up in this carnival where it's a land of no obligations, nothing going on, but it's also feudal. That's why you get all this wheel imagery. That's why, or just circular imagery going in a circle, repeating yes. the same thing over and over again, accomplishing Never escaping. nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that's why, uh, Miriam is introduced in a record shop. That's why she dies. Is that what that is? I was going to ask where she worked. Yeah. But, okay. When you notice it, it makes sense, right? Yeah. You've got the record shop, you've got the, uh, Ferris wheel, you've got the merry-go-round, you've got the water wheel and the tunnel of love circles everywhere. When in, in reference to this place and uh, Miriam specifically. And also, uh, you know, just the relationship between Guy and Bruno to begin with. Also, we skipped over something, a little detail I wanted to uh, go back and just not even talk about too much, but just mention. So Guy's last name is Haynes, right? Yes. Miriam's maiden name is Joyce. Joyce and Haynes. That's interesting. I don't know if that's a Highsmith thing or a Hitchcock thing, uh, but James Joyce wrote the book Ulysses in which there's a very notable character named Haynes, and 
I don't know how it would relate, but it's interesting because Haynes is also kind of a stock character. And also he's very much, he's very much a type of, uh, um, I don't know. There's a, that's a whole other conversation, but that's an interesting connection. And there's a good moment to stop talking about that because just, LOL. <laughs> fuck you, cowboy. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I was mentioning to Austin that I've always wanted to do that and never had the opportunity. <laughs> oh, man. You're so mean. Oh, here we go with all the obvious, like almost humorously obvious, like sexual undertones to all this stuff where, you know, Miriam and uh, Bruno are making eyes at each other, right? And she's eating the ice cream and she wants a hot dog and everything. Yeah. But also that's motivated plot wise because she's pregnant. This is really creepy camera move. Just the fact that he like appears. Hello there. <laughs> it's just like comically <laughs> creepy. Oh, excuse me. I was just looking at you. Don't mind me. And then uh, we see that he's going to win a Koopy doll. I don't know what that is. But uh, we... That's probably like some dumb... You know, they always have like those yeah. like little stuffed animal things there. But anyway, he's about to uh, ring her bell and then win her. So... <laughs> is he though? Because like she's still like... She gets kind of creeped out by him after this. No, not yet. She just saw him. That's... You see those eyes she's making, Max? He oh, even I... does the little like eyebrow raise. He makes his eyebrows dance at her. And then she raises an eyebrow as well. Yeah, and now then that's the last interest that we have in him. Just like No, she keeps looking back. Yeah, I don't but know. But anyway, the sexual imagery in that is obvious. No, definitely. He but rings her bell and then he wins a cupie doll. Which we don't see. I assume it's Where some is sort the cupie like, doll? It's Alfred Hitchcock's hidden fuck doll. That's the name what? he gave to it. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> ah, damn it. When's the last time you've been on a merry-go-round? Um, Probably a while. 1997. Um, it was June. When you were 16? It was warm day. Um, it was June 3rd, actually. I remember it distinctly. Um, it's the day my parents died. Oh, wow. That's got to be really upsetting. Yes. Um, it was... I was seven years old. Um, I just finished. Uh, Did you kill them? Yeah. <laughs> Damn it, Austin. <laughs> the whole build up for the story. Also, this merry-go-round pisses me off. Why? Because um, I don't know what the safety regulations were for <laughs> merry-go-rounds in the 50s. That's a very good point. But There's we'll, no like wires or anything. No, but like... Totally unsafe. That, but like, as we go later on, there's a speed control, and there's a fucking, apparently, an option for ludicrous speed. Yeah, we'll see that later. That's not oh. like... Oh, we were speculating on what the uh, circular imagery is doing. It's rotating a thing above it. Did you see that? Was that yeah. butter, maybe? Butter, I'm, yeah, stop it from, like, hardening. Um, yeah. The reason I noticed that, Max, is because uh, when the merry-go-round breaks down later you see the same looking sort of like tread imagery, right? Yeah. And it reminded me a little bit of like a film projector. You understand what I'm saying? I do, but... Slightly. Yeah. I don't know what that connection would amount to, but I, I just noticed that you see that image twice. It's the same sort of contraption. You think you wouldn't let just one guy go into the fuck island boat and, by, and, by mm. himself? Oh my god! He's literally eating popcorn because he likes to watch. He likes to watch. Look how excited he also, is! Also, do we do you get do you get the metaphor that They're he's going to the tunnel of love? Not even that, but like, do you get the metaphor that his boat is named Pluto and he fucking kills people? Do you get it? Do you, you get it? The land of he's going to bring you to the underworld. Yes. they're on a boat, Max, in this dark crossing cave. a river. Yeah, oh the my tunnel god. of love. This uh, this uh, Yannick, I believe, is the word imagery, and. Uh, and we're also crossing the river Styx. Yeah. So many layers. So many. So many. Wow. But that's a great moment we just passed over, genuinely, uh, where you get the uh, nice little tease about the shadow encroaching upon them and then the stream. That's always what Hitchcock is about. He's about the difference between what you're looking at and what, what you expect to see versus what the thing is and how that works also in, ter in terms of the interior mind of the character. And here we go. We we have arrived at Fuck Island. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. 
Do we have any listeners who grew up in the fifties? <laughs> is this is this how you guys <laughs> fuck? Is this how this happened? Yeah. <laughs> Come you on. Just go on to like I. This looks like a really small spatch. Like like it's just like a small patch of land in the middle of this lake, and uh, apparently there's enough space to to actually kill somebody though and get away with it. We have the A to G lighter, the, the the Hitchcockian object that's going to incriminate Guy later. We should talk about that soon at some point. But again, we hear Where we, did her men friend go? Like, I don't understand. She like she was running away playfully, but like Maybe they just got bored and decided to blow each other. <laughs> that would be the real homoerotic undertone of the movie. Yeah. But again, here we have uh also, why are they not suspects? I didn't understand that because they were the ones who. Yeah, I don't know. Like, there's yeah, there's some logical. There's some there's some very shoddy police work in this movie. But I wanted to visit that moment because that moment itself, when he strangles her, is again the culmination of like, you know, the perverse. Look at everybody just fucking everywhere. It's disgusting. It's just disgusting what goes on on this island. Oh God, those degenerates in the fifties. Yeah, so. with the rock music. Yeah. Anyway, so like the sock hop, it, like that that moment when he strangles her is the culmination of like this idea of the perverse expression of sexuality, right? It's the exact for him. It is like this sexual experience because clearly he enjoys killing, but also for her, it's the exact opposite type of experience. But it happens in the same way. You know what I mean? It's death with with uh, the sexual climax element in it, right? happens in the same moment and uh he sees himself importantly in the reflection of the glasses it's sort of a moment you can miss but i think on a big screen you might see it he see he recognizes himself in the reflection of her glasses which is maybe why he takes them and uh interestingly here he'll do this to blend in as he's leaving but also he helps a person with glasses who's blind i don't know if that's coincidental or not but but maybe some sort of idea. Again, you you mentioned uh, uh, what did you say? Did you say murder will, will out or murder most foul? Murder most foul. Well, anyway, in reference to uh, she, he goes through a Lady Macbeth thing yes. where he's going to start at least his ma his brain is going to start rebelling against what he wants and what he's trying to do, and he'll like go into a trance later when he sees Babs, aka Velma. What do you think about this scene? Um, we The importance of it is obvious because this is his alibi, but it does kind of come out of nowhere. And what purpose does it serve other de- than to set up the alibi thing? Does it have one? Um, it shows that he's always kind of awkward and just like passively polite to people on trains. Um, that he's a doof? Yeah, so it, I think this helps maybe assert the idea that he's not just like plot inconsistency stupid it's like no the character is stupid yeah and that he he never like understands other people (laughs) or like never like arrives at conclusions about them i do like that little line where he's like the guy's talking about like what he gave a speech about and he's like oh you understand i don't look it's the ghost capitol building oh yeah the very real capitol building wearing a ghost sheet over itself oh god that's funny and this is where the movie starts to lose me. Why? Um, there's literally no reason he should not immediately call the cops as soon as Bruno talks to him. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's just the premise, I guess. It's just like he, because you have to sell the idea that he's a doof. Ooh, I love how creepy this lighting is. The cinematographer for this movie. Oh, what's his name? I'm bad with names today. But he would go on to work with Hitchcock, I think, until Marnie, with the exception of uh, Psycho, because that was his TV crew. Also, but, if I see a scary, if I come like a, I'm a semi-recognizable, like professional tennis player and socialite and aspiring politician. If I see somebody beckoning to me, he's really bad a, at all in a dark things. alley. Yeah. Like he's I'm gonna, not going. He's down got there. A, a rough road ahead of him as a politician. Uh, but like, I love how like that imagery of the lamp and the shaded alley is so obvious, but something about its obviousness and simpleness is really effective in that. And it's a very creepy contrast. And again, we have more obvious lighting here in how first we see guy fully lit 
And then the moment he starts to understand, now we see the shadows of the gates across his face, right? He, Bruno literally dragged him in. And yeah, now they're now, both imprisoned together. Now they have the guilt. It's very simple, right? But it's not stupid. You know what I mean? Because it all works. It's all just like patched together perfectly. But it it's not trying to be uh, immense. It's just being very effective with what it's doing. Why, you maniac. Oh, no. We planned it on the train together. Remember? You're just like me. Okay. So I guess he does say, I'm going to call the police. Yes, but then he's completely outwitted and bamboozled by Bruno's impenetrable logic of, you might get in trouble too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, that's the thing, because Guy... That's the thing that's weird about it, because Guy... That's what I'm saying, where Guy must have that motivate like urge and impulse within himself to be murderous so powerfully he must feel that so powerfully within himself that to believe this right yeah he has to see himself as guilty of that constantly <laughs> if you're gonna believe that which is why bruno is again like an offshoot of his own psyche um if but you again, go to the you police know. now, you'll just be turning in yourself as an accessory. No, that's not how like literally any laws work. But it doesn't matter because he tricked them. Because he's you're stupid. going into politics. You should know stupid. how laws work. You stupid idiot. That's like the first thing politicians have to learn is what gets you arrested. Yeah, and what like you can get away with <laughs> when you're considered an accessory to a crime. Yeah. Oh man, we got to talk about something else right now. Okay. <laughs> something else. Um, my brain is going down. A, oh, I thought you were actually had something. No, um, no, no, no. Oh, way to go. go way to that, go, Buster. Why are you hiding? So, Yo, he did it. He th- did it. It's this guy. Oh, guy. He's insane and mis- it misinterpreted my frustration on the train as me wanting to murder somebody. Yeah. It's this guy. I mean, ask it's his, not me. It's, ask his dad. His dad is legitimately scared of him that he's going to do violent <laughs> yes, things. Yes, he wants me to kill his dad. I know his dad is around because I haven't killed him yet. Oh, God. Oh, guy. Stupid idiot. But anyway, uh, speaking of the incriminating stuff, uh, the important object of this movie is the lighter, Right? And it's one of those great Hitchcockian objects where uh, Hitchcock loves placing importance on objects. I think the most recognizable and famous of the ones he sort of popularized in in popular movies is this idea of the MacGuffin, uh, the object that motivates the plot but doesn't necessarily have an intrinsic value of its own. Um, The lighter is not a MacGuffin. It is a different type of Hitchcockian object. But it's an it's an object that also you see repeated throughout his films. Yes. Where it's one that instead of being a plot motivating thing, it does motivate action, but it becomes a signifier of a certain type of guilt or thing about a character that you have to prevent from all falling into somebody else's hands. Right. I think of notorious maybe where you can see the key as being an object that's maybe comparable. There's all sorts of different Hitchcockian objects. Actually, there's a very good essay on that in uh, the book, Everything You Wanted to Know About Lacan. Or no, which one is it? It's Everything You Wanted to Know About Lacan, but we're afraid to ask Hitchcock or the other way around. Either one of those. But there's a really good essay on those. And here again, we get introduced really to the romance and we see how awkward and forced it is. But, okay, so my question is, the senator's a very proper, rich, respectable man. Mm-hmm. Does he know this? So he, like, it's under the impression that, like, he knows that, like, they're going to get married at some point. Right. But he also knows that he's already married, and, like, he seems pretty cool with it. Yeah. I mean, that's the weird thing. He, like, he, you think he would be aware of the optics of that and immediately start trying to shut that down immediately. Yeah. But I do like that actor's performance. Oh, no, the, the senator's yeah. good. I'm just questioning his character motivations. I don't know. They don't really flesh it out too much. Maybe, maybe we can retcon this and say, like, oh, he would know that, like, uh, maybe the only way to extricate Ugh. himself from the situation would be to, like... You can tell he's a politician because he has a picture of George Washington taped to his wall. Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. Uh, oh, here's Pat Hitchcock. Wonderful. She's great in this. Yeah. I really love her in this. 
And she has great outfits throughout the movie. She is the most extravagantly dressed one out of them. More so than Bruno? Yeah, Bruno kind of sticks with his same thing the entire movie. I guess you get him, whereas yeah. she dresses smart. Is yeah. The thing. Yeah. Saying to Austin during our pre-screening for this that she gives me major uh, Velma vibes with yeah. sassy, blunt talk and the short hair and the big She's glasses. also the genre-savvy one. Yeah. Okay, here's the important close-up. She knows. She knows something's up, right, yeah. with that close-up. Uh, again, interesting moment in terms of the treatment of the female characters because it does give her this type of interiority, which I know is the most basic thing in the world, but I don't know. There's so much She's right, extensions. Though. Oh, uh, you mean Barbara? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to give all the smart lines to my daughter. If you want to know about the movie, you can just listen to my daughter. There you go. Or do you want me to do it in a high-pitched voice? No. Why? What? What are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm going to steal your notes so I can sound smart. No. Uh, excuse me? What's going on here? No. Oh, act more guilty, please. He could not look more guilty if he tried. <laughs> um, Max, I asked you a question when we were watching this during the preview screening. Yes. Where if you were completely innocent of murder, but somehow somebody like pointed you out as a suspect or something, would you also act this guilty? Because I feel like I would. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, that's interesting because like... I had I had grew up with strict parents and yeah. anybody who grew up with strict parents knows that strict like Alfred Hitchcock. Sure. Um but they breed the best liars. Um <laughs> so I'm very good at lying, but like if I'm genuinely telling the truth, I tend to get flustered. Right. Because I'm annoyed because like, no, but I'm not lying this time. This is genuinely true. Yeah, so. you don't want to be in a Hitchcock movie. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I guess I wake up in the morning and look at my face in the mirror and I'm like, Yep, that's a face people would say is a murderer's face. So I don't know. Well, how do you think you got me to do this podcast? I'm terrified. I killed your former. <laughs> I killed your your replacement. Yes. We don't need to talk about that. Um, and I dress you up as mother and everything. The the audience film podcast, which yeah. has been erased from the internet. Yeah. My, my original podcast. But okay, important moment. Barbara just said she's a tramp, right? She's expressing the thoughts of the audience that everybody is thinking. Yeah. Or some people are thinking in the back of their minds, right? You don't always have to say what you think. Yeah, exactly. And, of course, her father rebukes her and says she's a human being. Do you, do you know anything about a Alice Roosevelt? Uh, no. Uh, it was one of uh, Teddy Roosevelt's daughters, and she was, like, notorious for just, like, drinking and smoking and, like, constantly, yeah, speaking her mind and just being... Was all... she a scandal? Well, that's the thing. Like a foreign dignitary came to the White House once, and Alice was on top on top of the roof of the White House smoking. <laughs> and he made a comment to Teddy Roosevelt. I was like, "Oh, you should control your daughter." And Teddy Roosevelt responded with, "I can either be president of the United States or control yeah control Alice. I cannot possibly do both." Right. Um. But she gives me that kind of vibe. He's like, just "Sir, like, <laughs> I can't even get up to the stairs. I yeah. can't much less get on the ceiling. Maybe you'd like to do it." Why don't you get the fuck up there? Try to argue with somebody on the ceiling, on the roof. On the ceiling, it'd be very difficult. <laughs> and his daughter might have been possessed, but no, I get that kind of vibe from Barb, just like the rowdy, fun daughter of the politician. Mm -hmm. But again, that rebuke is important because we talk about how this movie really doesn't care about Miriam at all, but I think it encourages that perspective and then kind of rebukes us for thinking that she's just a tramp in that moment. And it does it again because... Even though Barbara is the character who is like, oh, she's just a tramp, she later feels victimized by Bruno by proxy when he's joke strangling that old lady and then like fixates on her and she says, he was strangling me. I could see it in his eyes. He wanted yeah. to strangle me. And she's crying, right? It's like the movie does this reversal on her and like holds her responsible for thinking that and then puts her through a similar experience. It's interesting. Mr. Haynes. Yes. 
Also worth mentioning that uh, Haines, Hain is French for hate, which is interesting. If you're going to go with the really obvious names, maybe the hate could refer to some sort of, uh, you know, suppressed desire present in Guy to, to be violent in the way that Bruno is violent. Well, like, they... Can I make a real a point right now? Sure. I'm just noticing about this. If we look at the calculus thing as contributing thematically to this, what is calculus? It's math. It's the absolute definition of structure and order. He's making an appeal to it now in front of the authorities, and the guy is just proven to be drunk. Yeah. Could you say that? Oh, she's reading The Big Sleep. So apparently... Uh, I mean, uh, apparently Raymond Chandler was dismissed after he made fun of Hitchcock for his weight. Um, Hitchcock was very sensitive about that. Uh, but nonetheless, Hitchcock's daughter is reading The Big Sleep in in a scene in this movie. So I don't know. Maybe he let her get away with it because she's his daughter. Yeah. Max, do you get boiled frequently? Oh, all the time. Um, Can't wait to get boiled tonight, man. I'm getting steamed as fuck after the Spectator Film <laughs> podcast. Um, oh, God. We need to do a, just an absolute trashed episode of the Spectator. No, to. that'd be awful. No. Uh, that'd be awful. Nobody wants to hear that. I do. We'll do it on... Uh, on uh, St. Patrick's Day. When we watched every Leprechaun movie ever made. No, oh. I you know I would do a marathon like that if there was some sort of live component. If we knew we had an audience and we could like do something where it's like, hey, for every person viewing for however many minutes we're gonna contribute however much money to whatever. We'll stream. We'll stream our reaction to every Leprechaun movie live. You can just see my face just like droop <laughs> throughout the day. Just starts melting, <laughs> like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> You open the box, the Leprechaun movies comes out, and it just melts your face yeah. off. No, by the time we get uh, to uh, Leprechaun, goes back to the uh, to the hood. Oh, it goes twice. Yes, he goes oh, wow. to the hood and then goes back to the hood. Um, Is it two with a two? Yes. Of oh, course. there you go. Um, but uh, yeah, at that point, you'll just be pearly white skull. Yeah, um, just be a good old skeleton. They're remaking those movie that movie. Like, what? Yeah. Oh, all right. Is this, is this where you think our discussion of Strangers on a Train would go? The Leprechaun remake? Actually, that's relevant to this film. Oh, okay. Please, tell me. Because Leprechauns are signifiers of Irish culture. And as I've already mentioned, this movie might be referencing James Joyce, who is the most Irish of all human beings, probably. Nice save. Um, anyway... So yeah, this was a very long scene. Oh, it's the one black character in the movie. Hello. Uh, yeah, I mean that's the thing about Hitchcock. He, you know, liberal humanist, right? I wouldn't it's not even that. in his like again, not liberal. That's just the term I'm. Yeah, using. I know. I I would go more of. I mean, really, he's quite conservative a, in some ways. He's very moralistic in his movies. Yeah. Well, he's a successful white British man who like yeah. never left his house. But he's also so uptight. He was raised by strict Catholic parents. Yeah. That's and again, he also was very sexually like he suppressed a lot of sex in his life. You often talked about how he was celibate. Yeah, right. Which is why I feel like you see him express kinks in his movies, and that's why I think his older movies are not as successful because when he was working within the realms of the Hayes Code, he had to be clever in expressing that stuff, and he had to do it implicitly. And when you have to do it explicitly, that's a creepy shot. Yes, that's really just well done. It's just a really great shot. I know there's there can't be too much of a trick to lighting that and doing that that specific way, but the, the, just the way he's standing there and the way they move the camera, beautifully done. There's some really great cinematography in this. Like we said, it's very sometimes simple and straightforward and obvious in in like what it's implying through the imagery, but it I think it always is beautiful in this movie. So great job. I would study this movie for cinematography, but again, I I, I to go back to Hitchcock's career. I think one of the things that creates a stumbling block for his later movies is the, uh, the lack of, uh, obstacles in terms of what he's able to represent on screen. Wouldn't uh, it be like, I don't know about costs, but like, wouldn't it be cheaper just to keep him in a cell for observation rather than like 
hire two full-time detectives to follow him around at 24 hours a day. To it might be cheaper, but also he's an up-and-coming politician. So fuck that. Yeah. Right? They can do whatever they what want. What does he do, though? Like, he's a tennis player. What, like, besides being interested in a senator's daughter, like... Well, he also, we know that he works for the senator. Yes, but, like... We don't know what he does, what capacity. Well, yeah, I, I made the joke that he's, like, a Jared Kushner type, where it's just, like, oh, my daughter's he's, husband... what, will. saving the Middle East? I don't know. Mm-hmm. God, I'm thinking about, like, politics way more than I thought I would. He's... You've brought it up much less than you usually do in episodes. Yeah, I'm trying. Um, suppressing it like Hitchcock suppresses its kinks. I'm going to make a movie about it. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock was gay, the movie. Um, I, there's been a lot of speculation about that, but I think it's more just that he... He disliked he, he, women. <laughs> I think... I don't know. It's really hard to speculate, but... Uh, wow, she has Inspector Gadget vision. She oh. can speculate on all sorts of... Th- and that's not the only Inspector Gadget moment we'll see, no. as we'll, we'll see when Bruno reaches into that <laughs> storm train. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Arm extension, go. Oh, I got the lighter now. Great. But again, he's, uh, he's turning the screws on Guy here. And again, o- very obvious imagery and the way the, this shot is set up. You have a very vertically oriented shot when they're walking into through the atrium, right, of... The, what is this building? Is this a museum? I don't know. Capital Pentagon. Or they said I've so. been in the White House, but not these other buildings. I was on a tour there once. Oh. It didn't look like that, so we can rule that one out. Uh, but it's a very it's a very ordered place, and he's in, Bruno intrudes into this space. And this part of the movie, I think, is you know you, you this is where you say <laughs> <laughs> murder here. <laughs> It is really comical, like Bruno's insistence. This is a really funny movie in a lot of ways. Yeah. I would it's say like, quirky more than anything, yeah. It's Isn't like, it? here's my murder diagram. And it is like something like a child would draw, almost. Like, yeah. this and is the house. Like, speaking of children, do you look at the way Guy is dressed here and just see him look like, looking like a kid playing dress-up at somebody who plays tennis? No, a he, little bit. but he does look like the most stereotypical fucking... Oh, famous thing. shot. Rich asshole. Famous shot. Yes. And creepy idea. That's all what Hitchcock is about, is uh, vision. And again, obviously Bruno is creepy for his capacity of vision. That's why he singled Guy out, because he's kind of like this voyeur, right? Who reads every page of the newspaper and, uh, and has locked in on all these details on his life and identified him for being his uh, P.I.C., I'm sorry. Any sport you can play while dressed like that isn't a sport. <laughs> uh, that's amusing that you just said that. Look at ugh. fuck you, tennis players. Yeah. If you're, it's, <laughs> is it a match? I don't even know. Yes, it is a match. But here's another interesting moment. Match Guy's last set. name is Haynes. Hate in French, and then what? They're talking to French people, and then. Bruno introduced himself as friends of a French family, right? Yeah, I don't yeah. know how he weaseled his way in here. Well, he speaks French clearly, right? Um, but we see him introduced multiple times in reference to this French family, right? And Guy's last name is Haynes. Do we see that also as being part of like, you know, just another indication that Bruno is is a split part of Guy's psyche that is the hatred, right? But that is still present in him intrinsically, but we see it explicitly personified in Bruno. And here we have the fun little implied romance yeah. plot going on between Barbara and Hennessy. I wouldn't say romance. I thought she's just like... Well, interest? Romantic yeah. interest. I wouldn't say romantic. I would just say like she's an eccentric girl and like finds stories of murder entertaining. So I think she finds it like... I don't like, know. Real, like Hennessy, ooh. Well, I got think, locked in an ice. I think she she's trying to flirt with Bruno here initially before she's like utterly terrified by him. But before the weird yeah. awkward eye contact. Also, yes. the way they end the scene is kind of hilarious. Do you remember? It literally ends with him continuing to look. Oh, yep. It's the uh, the spectacles, the glasses. Yeah. 
that trigger this moment. That special effect was weird. The flame kind of yeah. left her glasses for but a bit. But interesting, they just fade out of that scene while he's still looking at her. Yeah. They so don't, like, we do don't they see any resolution. Looking at her or, uh... Do you have to open that? You probably know what it is, man. It's gun shaped package. No, he doesn't know what anything is. <laughs> <laughs> he's a fucking idiot, Max. Oh my God. I own those books on the table. Those are editions of Harvard's classics uh, literature things. They're worth like $5 each, but they're all very old. I can't believe I just saw that. I have the same things as the props in this movie. Jesus Christ. Wow. Oh, well, that's interesting. Look at this. Oh, my God. But yeah, this is probably the closest moment we get to Guy actually doing any sort of internal debate about participating in Bruno's plan. Would you say so? I just, ugh, I don't understand the purpose of this scene other than like he's been fo- being followed for so long that like he's being friendly with one of the cops at this point. Right. But like there must be a limit on it. Like how long can they follow him? Like without any evidence until they whatsoever. Resolve the crime maybe. But he leaves the gun for now. but we see it set up and he considers it and then we'll return to it later. That's a lovely dress she's wearing. Agreed. And also I think there's a good moment to talk about because this dress does show off Aww. Ruth Roman's figure in a way that I think makes her look very mature and adult, you know, and how in this relationship in some ways she kind of wears the pants despite being very, we'll call it faithful to guy. Right. Well, yes, but uh, also she is, able to make decisions which is yeah superior to guy and she has powers of observation which guy does not have clearly by all these shot reverse shot sequences we get with her but you know the interesting thing about that is there's lots you know very much she embodies this idea of maybe the woman who's a little bit older than guy and is the more mature one in that yeah. relationship and i think this is a good point to talk about like how in this movie this is this is fucking insanity this is the weirdest dialogue yeah. in the movie. What the hell is he because talking about? Because we know Bruno is insane, but like he's also been relatively good at like being normal around other people. Well, here's here was my thought that he's literally just fucking with him and he enjoys being ridiculous. Well, there's that. I just like, enjoy saying ridiculous things to this senator. It's like uh Sasha Baron Cohen. I <laughs> guess. But like we don't get any other indicators that he does stuff like that. I guess I just assume it, but they, again, they introduce him friend of the Davils. I think he's supposed to be like insane. Like, I guess that's still supposed to be a hammering yeah. home. I just can't, crazy. I can't like square away that dialogue in my mind. This makes sense to me. Cause again, he's going to start talking about morality and murder. Right. And that yeah. seems in line with him, but the atomic like superpowers or whatever the fuck he's talking about, uh, or an atomic powered like dune buggy. Is that what he's talking about? I don't even know. It's weird. But again, I was going to say how, uh, you know, this is maybe a good time to touch on uh, Hitchcock's famous philosophy of treating actors like cattle, uh, where I think everybody in the film very, very thoroughly embodies uh, their character on a physical level, I think, you know, I but you can tell because a lot of the performances in this movie don't really jump out at you that they're just not directed very well, you know? Yeah. So he's like, I just... What basically what he did was he it's like he went to a, like a dog show and he picked out the best dogs or cow show right we'll go with his metaphor he picked out the cows that he wanted and they work perfectly he just didn't tell them where to go so I think everybody could be the you know if you have a director like Hitchcock who just cares a little bit more about performance maybe the performances in this movie are better maybe you have the right people there already. I mean, I do like Bruno's actor. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Also, this, we he knows how to charm old ladies from his, his ex- mother. Yeah, his this extended is a situation time his he can control. It's very easy for him. And it, these sequences maybe are the most creepy to me because this is something that I... It feels so human to me and recognizable, you know? And also because this is the most passive-aggressive I feel like he gets because he feigns so much joy when he talk, when he's talking to these people. And you know underneath, he's just full of like some sort of sinister intent and hatred underneath uh, and, and misanthropy. 
and yet he so easily he so easily charms these older women. But again, they're going to pay for this. Yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning too. You know how uh, these these older women are also kind of like caricatures, and uh, the movie in setting them up as being sort of trivial and rich and stupid in the way they're kind of doing right now, it almost encourages you to to judge them and be okay with what's about to happen, right? Yeah, also, like, the fact that I like, because he's getting frustrated with them because, like, he thinks the his idea is so fucking obvious. It's the, the one f- thing he cares about. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that they can't come up with it at all. It's the same thing he got frustrated with the judge about. When the judge sentences people to death, it's impersonal. Yeah. It's part of the system. And with Bruno, it's like, no, it should be personal. And it's like so right? many murderers go uncaught. Your way of thinking is dumb and stupid. And obviously I'm right. Right. But it's only about murder. Yeah. Also, with the amount of makeup she's wearing, like his hands would come away like matted with it. Yeah, I don't know about that. Well, I don't, I don't the, know anything about makeup. The amount of makeup everybody is wearing. This is a fancy party, though. It makes sense. It's I'm a just movie. Saying. No, People I'm not. I'm not, I'm not saying makeup is bad. I'm just saying like he's going to get some on his fingers. I'm um, sure he's fine with that. But again, here we have the uh, Lady Macbeth moment, right? Where he gets so freaked out that he's actually gone into like some sort of hypnotic state or whatever. And he's almost going to kill poor Miss Cunningham. That looked like it was uh, undercranked yeah. or something. But then the movie, movie punishes us for thinking this old lady is stupid and whatever by having her be like sobbing here. Yeah. And then having Barbara sob here. And then we have the oh, old she man. was frightened. Yeah, just completely dismiss everything about her. Um, dumb woman. Yeah. Oh, she was frightened. Haven't you ever been strangled by a man before? <laughs> I thought he was weird when he arrived. <laughs> Get him out of here as decently as you can. I don't know what's funny about that line to me. Oh, first thing you know, they'll be talking about orgies. Yeah. What? Huh? What? I, did we miss something? They, they, it is an orgy that happens later on. A yeah. line got cut from the movie. No. You don't go from somebody fainting at a party to orgies, sir. Well, I think it's supposed to be like you don't want him disheveled and like stumbling out of the mansion looking like that because you have I a guess. bunch of rich people there. That's what they're going to be saying. Those, those orgies, yeah. Punched in the face. Yeah. And a little bit awkward there where they added the frame of white. Well, like, I, it gives me, like, kind of a cartoony vibe when it's just, like... Yeah, it does. You get, like, the flash when you get punched. You always associate it with, like, the bam. Yeah. Yeah. So I get that, but, like, it is kind of tonally out of place in this movie. Hitchcock does that a couple of times throughout his career. I think another clear example of you can tell he's going for something. You can tell he's going for something because the frame of white is there and it's, like... You know, maybe it's like an impact, right? It sells the impact of it. But instead, what you'd do is you would re- just remove frames so the fist speeds up. That's what people usually do when, when people are punching, right? So it looks like the fist accelerates into them. Uh, but I guess it's harder to do when they're literally punching the camera because that was a subjective POV shot. Um, but I, I, it reminds me a little bit of that moment in The Birds when Tippi Hendren is in the phone booth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's just doing that awkward cutting thing, and she's, like, frozen. It's kind of strange. Yep, and here's Barbara's reversal, where she begins to understand. Everything's not trivial and fun. So I guess she does have kind of an arc. She yeah. has the she goes from the genre savvy person who treats it as something that's very romantic and interesting. And then it becomes real for her in this very, uh, you know, profound way. And then she contributes to his downfall in in helping to save guy. Well, she does directly more to help guy than, than Anne. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Although Anne also puts all this stuff together. She does. I don't know how, the mental gymnastics she's doing to understand. How does she know that Miriam has glasses? Did we miss something? I'm not um, quite sure. No. Well, we just supposed to know. Well, she's soon? about to ask. She's seen Miriam before, apparently. Um, yeah. 
We have to assume that. Very strange situation. Maybe they did have orgies. Maybe that's how they met. (laughs) Oh, my God. Then who's the father of that baby? Her father. That's what I was going to (laughs) say. Oh, God, we're awful. We're truly awful. So that's how you, is that how you reconcile the situation with Miriam? Yes. She wanted to. Because they don't have a mother. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, God. Oh, Oh, no. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You should look like, you should know what Miriam looks like. She's going to be your stepmom. This is actually a sequel to Eyes Wide Shut. Oh, Um, that's not what happens in that movie. Yeah, sure it is. Um, But anyway, I completely forgot what I was going to say. Oh, here's what I was going to say. Something I didn't even realize until thinking about the movie today, and it made me feel like a bad person. What gets lost in the, this equation here of Miriam dying? Bruno also killed the baby. Yeah. She has a baby. And as far as we know, she intends to keep that baby. Yes. But she hadn't told her male... No. Cohorts. As far that. as we know, all she told was, was Guy, right? Yeah. But well, in and the audience. In the, the audience. movie forgets about it. Yeah. It never comes up again. No, literally never. It's never It's kind of weird, right? And I guess it just maybe you could say the movie forgets about it, but also the characters totally forget about it too. Well, like because that's okay, I was saying that's like that's another interesting way you could take this movie is like let's say that like he just does it right. and then because we got Bruno's insane and like is never satisfied with these types of things. And he's like, well, actually I've killed two for you. So you still owe me something and just oh, like keep holy pushing shit. him. Yeah. That's a pretty good twist yeah. to this. Um, where instead you take it more like the book, right? Yeah. Which is, I think from my understanding of the book, the progression is more just watching the descent of guy where in this movie, it's more like talking about how guy is aspires to be a good person, but how the evil is in, present in everybody whereas i think in the book it's more that he's genuinely embodying this idea of a good person but he's tempted and he's corrupted along the way instead of being corrupted inherently by that well i don't think he's ever corrupted or tempted in this movie because he's too dumb like he comes across as too stupid and too thick-headed to like ever do anything that makes any sort of sense right but you but let's break it down in freudian terms because i think the movie like a lot of hitchcock's movies encourage that He, if he always is aware of this idea of the superego, right? And trying to yearn for structure, whereas Bruno more aligns with the unconscious, right? But I think you can say for him that he has the unconscious desire to kill Miriam. And that's why, why he didn't go to the police because he feels that so strongly. Well, I I mean... I guess. Like, I suppose... Oh, house is on fire. Yeah, I... Austin, like, we're missing, like, 30% of our bodies at this point. The room has been on fire for a while now. Yeah. So, like... Yeah, that's pretty good uh, audio editing on my part to to get rid of all of that. I I can't hear anything. I knew you could handle it. That's why I've kept talking and gritted my teeth through it. Yeah. Surrounds. Um, I, I don't know why you didn't edit out the fire alarm for that, but... I just wanted people to know what we were talking about. The Roaring Inferno. That yeah. was really good of you to edit that out. Yeah, we're going to be Is nice he going to do it? And toasty. What do you think, audience? Vote now on your phones. Is he going to kill Bruno's father based on everything we've learned about him in this movie so far? Well, I'm glad you brought that up, actually, uh, because that is something people use as a knock against this moment, really, where they're like, this is a like, misleading suspense. Because they don't buy, like you said, that he's going to kill him. Yeah. But if you do, this still works better. And I think the movie wants it to be the other option where he still hasn't truly made up his mind yet. And the the suspense is twofold. Not only will he be successful in doing this, but will he actually go through with it? Also, question. What? Bruno wasn't sure that he wasn't going to do it. What if he just, like, saw a figure in the bed when he goes in there and shoots him straight off? Yep. Gave him a gun and everything. <laughs> maybe Bru- maybe the gun is... Ooh, I don't know. The gun is full, I guess. There's no indication that it's ever empty. But uh, 
Yeah, also, if you're just going there to talk to his father, why bring the gun with you? Mm. Yeah. And you could say that, like... You know, I think that's why the the movie wants it to be that he's not sure yet. Yeah, but also, but like, I guess we don't buy it. You could make the argument it was just like, oh, your son gave me this gun, he bought it, but like, show it to him after that. Don't break into somebody's house with With a gun gun on you. (laughs) Listen, I was just trying to tell him something. It was really important. Whoa. Look, the dog didn't attack me. Obviously, I didn't mean any harm. Wow, we have Velma and Scooby Doo in this movie. Yes. Um, Although you could consider Guy Fred. He doesn't spend any time looking for any clues. And he doesn't have an ascot. No, but he does spend a lot of time hanging around two women while other people do more interesting things. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd watch... Uh, we, sh- we need to go back in time and make a Scooby-Doo movie with actors from this movie. I'd, sure. I'd watch that. Sure. Oh, And apparently they had so much trouble with the dog, that's why they had to slow that down. And it's funny, you can read that in uh, Truffaut's book with Hitchcock. It's quite funny. <laughs> it's kind of talking about how much how much of a pain in the ass that dog was. But yeah, it, I it, do love little things like that where like it's something that you never think about was like such a big deal. Like there's that famous <laughs> um what is it? Uh Michael Palin quote from when they were filming uh Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah. Uh they were in the woods and the tech crew was having so much fucking trouble like getting the fog right for the scene oh yeah and imagine. Michael Palin was getting fed up because it's like it didn't matter to him and he's like is the fog funny like, yeah it and that's something you're like you think it's like yeah it seems foggy but just like no it wasn't worth it at all <laughs> yeah. and it's like did we need that scene of the, the dog licking his hands not really no like you could just like builds the suspense put happy dog noises in and like show him petting the dog's head like oh my god max whoa it's bruno would you say that this moment also has like a weird feeling to it of like a secret rendezvous where he goes to meet his dad or something and bruno like is in the bed waiting for him it's, I don't know. Yeah. I know you don't buy the homoerotic undertones, but I see. I know. I don't know how I feel about them. I just. I don't like, know how I feel about them either, for the record. But because if they're there, they're used to yet again have gay people be that weird other. But, well, I think it is that regardless. Yeah. Honestly, but yeah, which is again, that's problematic on its own. I want to mention something about the lighting of this scene. Where uh, in, very interestingly, oh don't Jesus give him the gun! Christ. Don't He's give throw him a gun on the, the gun. Bed. Look, Bruno, you're terribly sick. You can't. How about you don't give the terribly sick person a gun, jackass? Why are you doing this? This is worse than when Jamie Lee Curtis got rid of the knife twice. She gets rid of the knife twice, and this is still worse than this. But anyway, I think it's interesting that this this uh, scene is is lit with the uh, source lighting of the lamp. Because usually when Hitchcock does that in, in the way when Hit, when uh, Bruno flicks the lamp on, it's very conspicuous. Uh, and it, it's very high contrast and creepy. And I like it. Now here's another question. Is Bruno legitimately questioning whether to kill him right now? I think he's like figuring out what's the best possible option for him right now. Yeah. I, Guy I, did a thing he didn't expect. <gasps> I think Bruno is thinking about it because he says later, don't worry, I won't shoot you. I'll do something much worse. Of yeah. course, I wouldn't shoot you because mother's at home and that would frighten her. But of course, then why would you give him a gun in the first place? Well, I think that well, the way, like, he at the end of the movie, when he's just like, oh, I'm sorry, I said I would keep it secret, but I can't do it anymore. He might have been planning to do that. He might have been... Well, I mean, that's what he says. He wants to fuck with him. But also, I'm no, not I'm sure. No, I'm saying, like, after, if he gave him a gun, and, like, he broke in, killed the father, and, like, that freaked out the mother. Right. He Bruno might have just been planning to let him do that then. It's just like, well, he's already killed his wife, and now he's... Just attacking random people. Yeah, there you go. Makes sense. 
totally makes sense. But, uh, yeah, one thing we should talk about in that scene that we talked about earlier is how that eliminates the type of moral ambiguity that we associate with Guy being implicated in the plot, where at that moment, it becomes very easy to say, okay, Bruno is now evil. Guy is now good. And the wall between those two things is back up for the rest of the movie. And I think the movie kind of loses something for that, you know? Yeah. It loses just a little extra touch that might make those tennis scenes a little bit more interesting to, to sleep through. Well, he strangled a lady at my father's dinner party last night, so maybe you should reconsider that. <laughs> He's a very naughty boy. Mm. The weird thing about what the mother is saying right now, and by the way, we won't even talk about what exactly Anne's thought process was with doing this, uh, but the weird thing about what the mother is saying is that it's totally not like mutually exclusive to him also being a murderer. Right, where she's talking yeah. about it being a, a whole practical joke, right? Well, that's the whole way he killed Miriam. Yeah. Right? He plays on things he, he knows that she wants out of him. She finds him attractive. He knows that. He's going to manipulate her, right? And then just when she might expect him to be making a move towards her desire, he flips it and does the worst possible thing. It is a practical joke both of those things at the same time. So the mother, in a way, is telling the truth. More so than she's aware of. And I love, like, both the mother and Bruno have, like, the thing where they're just like, well, go, go away now. <laughs> uh, please go away. Thank you. Yeah, I'm done with you. He really likes this robe. Well, wouldn't you? Look at that. I don't know. It's a little bit... uh loud for me no Austin you could pull it off swimmingly get you a pipe yeah I will know what the weird thing about this is he's wearing a robe and it looks like he has a button up shirt underneath it yeah that's how you wear ropes <laughs> well there you go and a scarf yeah well, an ascot oh, the, oh there you go yeah he should loan it to guys so he can be Fred yes and of course he's fucking with her now but here's the question. Is he fucking with her or is there an awareness between them that he's blackmailing guy? Right. Because he starts talking about the lighter and everything. Right. Just so I think he's trying to communicate to her that guy is fucked. Yeah. Because he has the lighter. He holds all the cards basically. Yeah. And he's doing so implicitly and passive aggressively in doing so. Yeah. Which again is why he is so sadistic. Because he doesn't just come out and say say things. He, well, and also, if he comes out and admits it to her, like, he's admitted it to another person. Right. So... But he can do... He does... He, he's basically doing that in this scene. And he it, knows he, she understands that he's doing that. Yes, but yeah. he's not implicitly saying anything, so she can't go to the police and yep. just be like, oh, he admitted it yep. to me. That's why he is so much fun to watch in this. No, he's definitely the standout as far as the main characters go. Because it's but. the great acting thing. <laughs> he does that same thing. Or you can go now. <laughs> Uh, but it's the great thing about that type of performance where every line is pregnant with meaning, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you can say something Whoa. while saying something literally different. That's a weird shot, yeah. Yeah. Lock the camera down. Both Jesus of these Christ. are weird shots. Oh, Max. Oh, look at all this tennis. Look at all the tennis play. Look how look. exciting this is. Look at all those like 80 other rings where people are playing tennis and there's no seats around any of those. Excuse me, it's called a stadium? A tennis stadium? Or no, a stadium is a building. What would it be called? Okay, don't interrupt me if you don't have answers. Um, or jokes. But look, they're like, there were so many other tennis courts and nobody's around any of those, but there's just the one that ever, I don't I don't know. Yeah. But Ten tennis fans, if we haven't scared you away by now, what, what what's the point of that? Yeah, tennis losers. Get in touch with us, I dare you. Yeah. Andrea Gossi. That's a tennis guy, no, right? Her going is an amazing idea, honestly. To what? To Metcalf. Like, and keep the police's attention here. Like, that's... Yeah, maybe. Th that's great, honestly. I don't know. Um, but I think it's important to mention here that, yes, now that Anne understands things too, he he now has the freedom to have agency. Yeah. As which, a character. Thank God. 
But yeah, unfortunately, he's finally allowed to have agency. And then we're treated to the most boring fucking scene in the entire movie, which goes on for 80 years as we watch him play tennis in real time. Um, That's why it takes so long is because as they age during this (laughs) tennis match, it gets harder for them to move. (laughs) Oh, my God. I forgot where the ball was. Is it over there? Which one is it? And treat those... Where am I? Uh, 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 just the same. What What does that say behind his head? Imposters. Oh, that's interesting. Too bad we can't see what that says. But yeah, I think the fact that her knowing releases him to, to have agency also just reaffirms her status as an accessory character because then she becomes the portal through which he has emotions and changes. Um... But yeah, that's just the way it is in this movie, really. Guy Haynes and Fred Reynolds. Oh, God. Okay. Can you, can you think of anything more boring than watching tennis? Polo. Por- polo, you got horses. Yeah, I don't like horses. Um, oh, this is the closest the movie comes to saying that guy is stupid, too. Where a guy outright calls him almost lackadaisical. Yeah. Well, he plays tes- te- tennis like how you're supposed to, very methodically. Like you wait for the other person's yeah. shot, and then you respond to the different thing. How do you win tennis? Um, what? But what are the stages? So you win a match, and then there are however many matches. Match in game. Set. Match game set. And then it's a game again. No. So it comes back around. Right. There's, it's no. an endless. It's an en- it's an infinite regression. You can never actually win at tennis. No, oh, yeah. Well, nobody's ever stopped playing tennis, so it's like we'll never know. Yeah. No, Quidditch is actually interesting. I, w- I would. There are people who actually play Quidditch. Um, yeah, there sure are. Yeah. Um, you know, I used to like Harry Potter. Like, I was never like obsessed with it, but like, I was always like, oh, what a charming cultural milestone. There's a lot of charming things about um, Harry Potter. Now, I want to say everybody. Read another fucking book, please, for the love of God. Maybe we can grow grow up past it, though, too. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. There's, like, some ancient, like, mon, like, yeah, Stonehenge era mon, like. Monolith? Monolith type thing. Like, monument was defaced recently, and somebody spray painted the Deathly Hollow symbol no. and wrote always on it. Oh, Jesus. What the hell is wrong with you people? Read another book, everyone. Or how about you just leave shit like that alone? Yeah. Leave it alone, please. Well, maybe if you read another book, you'd find that a lot of them are other, like, they're just as good, and you can get absorbed into different worlds. Anyway, we're not going to talk about J.K. Rowling. Why I'm... not? What the fuck else are we going to talk about right now? Oh, yeah, I forgot we're doing tennis. Um, J. I was going to say, like, I totally have no problem just talking about Harry Potter. J. The scene. J. Ooh, J. That R- guy got hit in the arm. Go that was dangerous. J.K. Rowling needs to stop writing. And, like, I, I've mentioned this before, the whole thing of, like, people have been talking about how, like, her books weren't, like, necessarily as diverse as they could have been, especially for, like, a worldwide wizarding school and whatnot. Yeah. And... Oh, 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 yeah. Okay, we're done watching tennis. We don't have to. Oh, we'll come back to it. But yeah, but oh, he's using the A to G lighter. Every time we see that lighter, we see the. The older a movie gets, the more like I really need a cigarette during it <laughs> because people are just constantly fucking smoking. Yeah, I think the scene would be better if we saw more reaction shots of people watching. Yeah, honestly. especially if their heads are going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth over and over again. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, J.K. Rowling. I, I, I like the fact that he's not letting anybody else see the lighter to the point where it makes him suspicious and kind of an asshole. Um, what makes him seem like a rich prick now, which yeah. is weird, but very specifically or that st- sort of thing. Or stingy, like I don't want to yeah. waste the fuel on you, so here's a match. Um, yeah, exactly. It's interesting how that touch comes in really hard. We know he's wealthy. Yeah. Right? But also, like, it's interesting how that touch comes in very definitively uh, in, in this part of the movie. Oh, God, we haven't even reached the halfway mark. Jesus Christ. Because <laughs> remember, he's he he's about to have a straight set win, and then the other guy comes back, which begs the question, big plot hole in this movie, why wouldn't you lose? Yeah. I know that's obvious, but like, 
you don't even have to lose terribly. You just have to kind of lose. You well, know what I mean? Is he expected to win? Like I don't know. If it was like, oh, he's going up against shit muncher Joe, the worst tennis player this side of Tennessee. Oh. <laughs> shit, shit muncher Joe. <laughs> but like, <laughs> if he was really supposed to win, and then like this guy's like turns out to be better, like set up the stakes for what's going on in this right. tennis match. Right. You know what I mean? Like. Right. But at least it gives our <laughs> our leading sorry. ladies an opportunity to do something, right? Because while he's fucking around, wasting his own time <laughs> by <laughs> trying to win, did they just shoot a bunch of fucking footage? Like, I guess. It's like, we've got a ton of tennis footage. Do you just want to use that, Mr. I Hitchcock? mean, I guess it's supposed to build up tension. It's just like, oh, no, it's taking so long. He's going to get there beforehand. He's going to do you, it. But if it occurs to you that he should just lose, you're just like, why isn't he losing? And it's also, if you don't like watching tennis, it's just then boring. like... boring. Because, I mean, I can watch things that I'm not interested in on a movie, and I can think you can do it in a way that makes me interested oh, in yeah, the movie. Oh, yeah, definitely. But this doesn't do that because it's just shot, reverse shot of them slapping a tennis ball at each other. But again, the fact that he's tied up in this, at least, I guess, gives them an opportunity to uh, make plans in the stands. Yeah, you're wasting time, you fucking idiot. Jesus Christ. Just lose. Just lose the tennis game. I can't believe we're still on the tennis game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess we can talk about JK. Oh, wait, no, we're going to get immediately interrupted. We'll, we'll talk about magic. What else do you want to talk about? Um, what is the weather like? It's it was snowing. Boring. It was snowing yesterday. <gasps> You're right. We were about to be interrupted by Inspector Gadget. Yeah. But I also wanted to stop and say that reaction shot for when he drops it is surprisingly hilarious. It's like both understated and perfectly uh, like melodramatic at the same time. Like it's just a great oh fuck face. And I always appreciate it when actors can do something like that in an interesting or original way because those are cliche moments, right? So yeah. if you can find a good, entertaining way to do it, it's it's interesting. And here again is another moment where the like the wealth part of his character really comes through strong. Yeah, you get this really like entitled, shitty, like rich person who's like, "Hey, unscrew this fucking storm drain so I can get my stupid knickknack." Don't do, just stand there. Do, do something, something. your lower classes. Yeah. I'm going to have to use my inspector gadget arm. Fine. Yeah, it's a good thing that he brought all those people over to witness it, which didn't yeah. seem like a smart idea, especially since he was so careful not to show the lighter before. He's just blindly reaching down there because he can't see it. No, he can't. I love how a crowd is gathered around him. It's really dramatic, Max. Mm. Oh, no. Oh, well, he's fucked forever now because he can't get his arm down there any further. Nope, he can't. There's no way he can. Oops. Max, I don't know how to get any more tension out of this scene because there's <laughs> clearly no way he can get his arm down there. No, we saw. It was like at the edge of it already. Yeah. With beads of sweat on his face. Yeah. He's trying as much as he can. Oh, my God. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Deuce. Oh, here we go. Back to the movie. I don't know how this is happening, but I think go, the go, hand gadget is extendo good. arm. Yeah. Oh, what was the other one you said? What, Mister Fantastic? Oh, there you go. Yeah, it's either one of those. Maybe that's what he was talking about with those like atomic dune buggies or whatever. Oh yeah, I got superpowers. Me, me, my wife and two of my friends are we're going to use a spaceship and we're going to yeah. get life force radiation and we're going to turn into the Fantastic 4. This is really great hand acting though. I think it really sells like the like oh almost got it, almost got yeah. it. Yeah. If only it was an intercut with the most not intense tennis match of all time. Why would you cut to the announcer's face? <gasps> oh my god. Is he supposed to be excited by this? Also, is Guy good at tennis? I'm very skeptical that if you were really into tennis and you're still listening to this after we shit all over you, <laughs> uh, I, I, I would be curious to know how good Guy is at tennis because I have a feeling he sucks. 
<laughs> and that it's not really that dramatic if you are aware of tennis and how it's played. He won, Max. Yay. It's finally over. It's finally over. But how does he know, like, the cops won't amazingly, like, it, like instantly come up to him? Rather well, than that's because uh, Barbara and... Well, uh, yeah, she distracts one of them and does not distract the other one. Yep. And then he slips out. In his underwear. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it looks so much like underwear. It's funny. Oh! Oh, my God. Yeah. And then he sneaks out. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. She did it. Yep. Good job, it. Velma. Penn Station. Yep. Oh, they're in the Southamptons. So rich, rich place. Well, yeah, they just spent all day watching a tennis match. Yeah. You- Who's got... I don't know who has time enough to play. I mean, we just have to stop fucking with the tennis people. <laughs> I don't care. I, I really don't. Even if we found out, like, our one dedicated listener was a tennis Neil player. Neil Gaiman loves tennis. Well, <laughs> Neil Gaiman is not our one listener. Oh, we need to instar- stop insulting such a genuine... Like, that is Penn Station. Um, yeah. But, oh, God, we need to stop insulting the man. Him and his beautiful wife. <laughs> By implying that he's... That he listens <laughs> to our podcast, Yes. Mr. Gaiman and Miss yeah, Miss Palmer, we're very sorry for insulting you, so. Yeah. Oh god. That was that was quite a that was a pan shot. Um Yep. Another sequence where somebody runs through a train station. At least he's not playing tennis now. I'm glad of that. <laughs> what if he had to be? He had to be constantly playing tennis. Continually ten- playing tennis? No, so you don't understand. It's a it's a match that just happens to go to Penn Station and on this train. They do it on the go. And toward Metcalf. You know what's really weird? I once in Grand Central Station watched uh, in that like side atrium area. They had set up a giant arena thing. Okay. <laughs> Metcalf! Yeah, we have to mention why why is that extra... Why is his like reaction shot so like emphatic when he says Metcalf? It looks like his eyes are bulging out of his head. He's very excited that he got a line in the movie. Yeah, he wasn't expecting it. Metcalf, sir. Metcalf. Why did you do the <clears throat> remix there? I don't know. Because tennis the re- fucks with my mind for the remix in the Spectator Film Podcast. But anyway, anybody, uh, anybody who wants to make a Nightcore remix of any of our podcasts, you have my blessing to do so. Um, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, to finish what I was saying about Grand Central in that atrium area, they had the, uh, they, they had, it's not wall ball. What is it? Squash. They had the squash world championships set up in the atrium. Oh God. And I just watched as I walked by and I'm like, wow, this, this is kind of interesting and also slightly depressing at the same time. The world championship for something could just be in the side of an atrium somewhere. Do you think guy in that moment is thinking, I hope this doesn't happen to me on this train that I have to talk to another guy and have lunch with him. So we speculated when we were watching this that, you know, even though people didn't want to get a shower after Psycho, that this movie might have more of an impact where you wouldn't want to go to some like fuck island. Yeah. In um, a carnival somewhere. Get again to our listeners who were sexually active in the 1950s. Um, (laughs) Did this movie hurt Fuck Island trips? Please let us know. Yeah. Um, but apparently, according to that gentleman, the opposite thing happened. Where that became a hot spot. Well, no. Apparently, it was on and off. Immediately after, nobody wanted to go there. Right. But then... They at, probably thought, well, somebody's got to clean it up first. Well, then... And then they went there because they wanted to see the scene of the crime. They didn't want to actually fuck there, though, from what I understand. At least, at least from that context. Max... I think we can all assume that they wanted to fuck there. <laughs> they wanted to fuck on the body outline, and uh, yeah, that's just what happened. I don't mm-hmm. think there's any. We've been talking about Hitchcock projecting ambiguity there. I think we've been talking about Hitchcock projecting fetishes. I think we need to talk about you. Oh God, here we are. The climax of the film, which also kind of doesn't have much, like. 
so he gets there. But we know Bruno is like, the guy is close enough behind Bruno that it doesn't, like, not, none of this matters. Well, we know that Bruno is getting close to being able to put the thing on the island. But right. How. They've reopened it up after a murder investigation. Anything they find there now is not relevant. Yeah, it's not relevant. Like, right. They searched the island already. Right. And th- it's a plot hole. Yeah. Plot hole. Because uh, we, you just, I guess you would assume that about police procedure. Yeah, I, I, I know that, like, police procedure wasn't as tight. Like, there wasn't a lot of... Oh, I don't know. I don't know anything about police procedure. But I would just assume that after they swept something and then they found a lighter after, like, I don't know. It, it seems like it's harder to draw the same conclusion after the police have always, already been there. Yeah, and there's literally nothing stopping him from denying that that's his lighter. It says from A to G on it that doesn't... Especially since... It's Anne to Guy. Yeah. And we've seen how faithful she is to him. She could just say no. I guess they could track it down and check if they, because it is engraved specifically. But, but yeah, you know, it is a little bit of a plot contrivance. But uh, at least we get a really great set piece out of it. Oh, yeah. I, that, my brain phased that out, but it is the most entertaining part of the end of the movie. Um, the merry-go-round of doom. Yeah, the fucking ludicrous speed. And, right? and the craziest thing in this movie, which is the guy who climbs underneath it. We'll talk about that when yes. we get to it, but the guy actually just did that and apparently almost gave Hitchcock a heart attack on set because Hitchcock was uh, mortified by the idea of doing that. But I understand that. I mean, Max, if you were directing a, a big movie like this and you had a situation where somebody was going to do that, where I don't think you would be allowed to do that really today. As simply, there would have to be insurance things. Well, really, it, it depends on like what actor, because like you have actors like Tom Cruise and whatnot who insist on doing all of their own stuff. But even that is different, because what I'm saying is, literally, they had the thing going and they yeah. sped it up slightly, but literally, he still would have died if he just lifted his head. Yeah, and I don't know if that was somebody who, if that's something people who do work at carnivals or, or something do, and they can do without being worried about it. But he literally just did that. Time. My only there option. There's no like safety net, is what I'm saying. My only option is to go on to the merry go round. I guess so. I guess he just panics and he doesn't know what to do. So he goes to the. Uh, okay. Can we talk about the fucking police officer here? Yes, thank you, police officer. We never, like, they never talk about how that oh. guy is just dead. Oh, yeah, here we go. There's the. Uh, Set merry go round to ludicrous speed. Yeah. This boy's loving it. Yeah, he is. Even though he almost dies several times. Um, He's just amused. Give me the lighter. After somebody's been shot and we're on this merry-go-round going like a hundred miles an hour. (laughs) You knew that? And you never like reported that? No, because I think the thing is he's talking about Oh, here's the guy. But I think the thing is that other guy is talking about Bruno and they think he's talking about guy. Well, well, I know that, but like if the guy knows it's Bruno, then why did he not go to the police beforehand? Because he didn't recognize him, but he saw him again. And now that they're fighting, he recognizes it. But you could also see that as another plot contrivance. Speaking of safety regulations, because we're talking about the guy. (laughs) I'm glad you brought that up earlier. Um, Why? Why would you ever make it so it could go this fast? There's no reason for that to exist. But you know somebody was like, listen, just <laughs> in case you want to, this is a really cool merry go round because it goes at ludicrous <laughs> speed. It's going 95 miles per hour right now. Oh, fuck. you just die if you lifted your head. You'd die. Yeah, kid, beat him up. Beat the shit out of him, kid. (laughs) Oh, my God. I love how mean Bruno is to children. He just tries to murder this kid. You know what would be great? If, like, that kid was wearing a cowboy hat and it was the same kid that Bruno... (laughs) 
Fuck you for popping my balloon. I remember you, mister. You caught... What if that's how they pit, like, ID'd Bruno? Oh, no, my God. That, yeah. Like, I remember that guy. Yeah. He popped my balloon. Uh, I wouldn't like that as much. I wouldn't either, but I'm but, saying it's a thing a movie would do. But I would like it if that was the same kid. And yeah. you get the reaction shot out of Bruno. Yeah. And, he's, and Bruno recognizes it. And now he just wants to be spiteful to this kid, too. Yeah. And he pushes him out of the <laughs> merry go round because it's the same kid. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Oh, God. Kill him. Kill him. I think they're adding more people. Because there were like three people in the merry-go-round. This merry-go-round just gets larger and larger, Max. There's like five more now. Yeah. Kill him. There's a forerunner to uh, Spielbergian time-expanding edits. It's human-expanding edits. Well, Bruno, killing him here doesn't do anything for you. I hate to say it. Well, I think he just hates him. He does, but like... He knows he's going to be found guilty, but he's like, I'm still going to kill you, you stupid asshole. I had a perfect plan. I would be really annoyed if a guy this stupid fucked up my plan. He looks like Ted Cruz in that shot. He kind of does. Yeah. I mean, Ted Cruz has been killing for quite a while now. Yeah, so. we all know it. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh my God. That horse turning toward the camera is actually yeah. kind of freaky. And we talked about this, too, during the preview screening. Yeah, it's great. Um, great uh, background uh, mat shot. Yeah, there's a split rear, second yeah. where you can see like or where it kind of cuts shot. off. But no, it, it's, it's rear, rear screen, screen projection. projection. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's great because they hide the seam with the crowd in front. And because yeah. there's so much dust being kicked up in the air, it sort of masks the grain. No, you, you could yeah. definitely mistake that. It's like an actual thing. Yeah, if, it looks great. It's really clever. Really well done. Uh, and he's finally, finally vindicated. Although they, I guess they only thought he was guilty for a shorter amount of time, but it's not like he was formally accused. No, you wouldn't do that. No matter like you would never let this guy near the other guy, especially if he's about to die. Right. And even to the end, Bruno just wants to, Fuck him over. Yeah. It's like Bruno is so full of hatred that he suddenly has amnesia that they were just fighting. You know what I mean? And that everybody saw them fighting. Yeah. And he's like, well, I'm still going to try to to fuck with them. Oh, God. I'm sorry. I don't have it. I was going back to get it for you. I'm sorry. As if they were co-conspirators. Yeah. Of course, the, the thing about this is even if the police chief doesn't let Guy search his outfit for the uh, yeah. lighter, they're still going to find it. Right? Yeah. Because now the police are going to sweep this because this is one hell of a crime now. Yes. So Well, they're probably going to shit in this carnival for fucking terrible negligence. And right. also, one of their officers is probably going to jail for fucking killing a civilian. Yeah. Um, for shooting a gun at a merry-go-round with children on it. Yeah. <laughs> at least the guy they killed was old. <laughs> <laughs> he was planning on doing that anyway. He's like, I'm just going to go out by turning this thing to ludicrous speed and just riding off into the sunset. Yeah, he was actually fucking a terrorist. Like, he was yeah, just going to do that. When it goes off its axle and, like, yeah. the, the horse flies off into the sky and it disappears in, like, a little twinkle. I have to go now. My planet needs me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Bruno. Very clever fellow. Don't say that to him. He's a murderer. Yeah. He only, he only says that because he realizes now how truly stupid he is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I was the senator, I'd be really disappointed that my daughter was marrying such a stupid <laughs> person. How well, could you I, do this to well, me? Well, I'm in Congress, and I'm surrounded by idiots every day, so I guess he'll fit right in. Oh. Isn't that a clever political joke? No, because they're not idiots, Max. They're fucking evil. Yeah. Not mutually exclusive. By the way, can we just... Um, you said you thought the ending was a really big yeah, this, bow. Yeah, this joke. And it is a bow. But also the joke has in it the implication that he has not changed. 
and that the loose thread has not been tied. Eh, I wouldn't go that far. I He's would... about to start talking to him. I know it's a joke. I know it's a joke, but... Yeah, what are you going to do? But that has been strangers on a train, trainers on a strain. What? what um... I know you were about to say something else, <laughs> and then you recovered. What was it going to be? Were you going to say stranger things? Were you going to say uh, uh, strange days? I don't know. Um... The, yeah, this has been Stranger Things season four. Um, I don't even know what season they're on in Stranger Things, honestly. Um, but anyway. Uh, Strangers on a train. We watched some tennis. We watched some merry-go-rounds. It's been a great time. We're happy you joined us for this show. Um, Do you have anything else to say about the movie? Uh, about this particular movie? Um, not much. I think we covered a lot of it. Um, there is some class uh, dynamic things that I would have been wanting to talk about just a little but not enough to really talk about during the commentary right um, right i mean it's really hard to cover all the bases with hitchcock because there's so much going on mm-hmm. and i'll try to link to a lot of stuff in the show notes that you can check out um because there's you know we said this is not one of his like greatest movies but this is a notable one from a period in which he was making movies that were not you know big hits really or quite as notable and this is a big return to form for him in in a certain sense so you know this this movie has a lot of stuff on it that you can find on the internet and i'll i'll link to some i would like to do vertigo sometime far in the future i mean we can do all sorts of movies because we do but we both love that film so um ouch you're breaking things um but yeah it's it's a good hitchcock movie it's not his best it's not the worst but it's it's good Hitchcock. Solid. It's solid. It's, if you want a general idea of what kind of Hitchcock's about, then this is a good place to start. Yep. And uh, I I pretty much it. You know I I honestly after watching this, there's some good parts about it, but honestly, I'm not sure how eager I'll be to revisit this because it does. I don't know. It is just so straightforward. Yeah, it's straightforward. It doesn't have the interesting parts to like you know the other movies that he's done, even the less successful ones. Um, like you might say this movie has a much better structure or, uh, is maybe in some ways more efficient or effective than something like rope, but I'd much rather watch rope. Really? Cause rope has more interesting ideas going on in it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and even stuff like, well, I was going to say foreign correspondent, but that's not true. I'd rather watch this than foreign correspondent, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of good Hitchcock movies we could do. Um, but I'm glad we got the first one in the bank. So you can visit our website, spectatorfilmpodcast.com, where we've got all our social media and all, oh no, that's just it. So, uh, all our social media and uh, all of our episodes. Oh yeah. That, you that's know, true. The, the that's thing right. that you're supposed to be listening to. Um, right. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, we're also available on, uh, iTunes and, um, well, we don't say that we've never said that. Why would we start saying that now? We've said it before. No, we haven't. Have um, we? Probably. Oh. We're also uh, we're putting out vinyl editions of our episodes now. Um, they're a limited run, one copy each. So make sure you get your hand on those. And oh God, the noise is back. Uh, I think that's signaling us to us to stop. <laughs> this is the cosmos organizing yeah. its forces against us. We'll see you next time, everyone. Bye. <laughs>